Okay, so welcome everyone. You are here at the first Climate Friendly and Equitable Communities Rulemaking Advisory Committee meeting. And just a reminder, this is being recorded. Um, we are so thankful to everyone for your participation today. My name is Sylvia Tuberoski, and I'm a facilitator with Kearns and West. Um, just a company that helps government agencies with community engagement and facilitation of public processes like this one. And I'll be helping to facilitate the rulemaking advisory committee today and for your future meetings. And just before we begin, I do want to go over a couple of webinar protocols um, and our tent of the meeting. So really today's meeting is intended to get to know one another and build a shared understanding of the role of this committee and your important work here and also to hear your insights on how to center equity into the work of reducing climate pollution. So kind of before we get started in earnest, just wanna review a few remote participation protocols. You've probably all gotten very used to Zoom and the remote world in this environment that we're operating in, but just in case you're not all very familiar, uh, a few reminders. So the meeting's being recorded and hopefully you've all been able to join the audio via your computer or via your phone, but not both. And if you think you might be having some issues with uh, troubleshooting or technology, please message the host, which is Kasaria at DLCD, and she can help you out with any of that. And we are hoping to mostly use the chat for troubleshooting issues rather than substantive conversation, which we hope to have in the room today. And just a reminder, please keep yourself on mute when you're not speaking, whether you're on the phone or the webinar platform, um, but not both. And when we get into our Q&A and discussion periods, just because we are gonna have so many people on the line today, we ask that you please try to raise your hand to get in the queue to talk. And you can do that by clicking raise your hand in the platform or pressing star nine on your phone if you're joined by phone only. And we'll show you how to do that in just a second. And also a reminder to say your name before speaking so that we can just get to know each other as much as possible. And use your video if you can. Um, if you're having bandwidth issues, we totally understand, but that really helps so that we can see each other as we talk. Uh, we know this is a three hour meeting and you might have kids and puppies and cats at home. So move around, take care of yourself as needed. Feel free to take, take breaks from video um, to go get water, whatever you need to do. And just the Zoom platform, so hopefully on the screen you see something like this, and at the bottom you have your mute and your video functions. Um, also, and another important feature of Zoom is this participant list, so if you cover on the bottom of your screen you see participants, that's where you can also go to mute yourself or to raise your hand. You might have a raise hand icon instead of the word, depending on your version. Um, and there's also a chat button here, so that's where you can chat Casaria if you have any, any troubleshooting questions with the platform. And also we see that most of you have your correct name in the Zoom platform. If you don't, if you open that participant list and hover over your name, you can actually rename yourself there if you wanna put in your first, last name and your organization if you would like. And in terms of the platform itself, there's also a couple of view options um, to see the videos. So at the top of your screen, you'll see either these kind of three um, squares or speaker view. Speaker view means you just kind of see who's talking at any given time. And the other three squares are the gallery function where you can see multiple people talking and kind of get the sense of being in the room together. So those are just some of the um, features. So I'll go into this in just a second. So now I am going to um, stop sharing my screen and we'll turn it over to Commissioner Nick Lelak, who is a RAC co-chair and a liaison to the commission to welcome us. Thank you very much, Sylvia. And uh, good morning, welcome everyone. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Nick Lelak. I serve on the Land Conservation and Development Commission. And before I continue with my brief introduction and provide some opening remarks, it is my honor and pleasure to um, introduce Candace Jimenez to read our land acknowledgement. So I'll turn it over to Candace. I'm actually not sure if we have Candace on the line yet. So perhaps we can, um, we can do that a little bit later when she's on. Sounds good. Thank you, we'll, we'll continue, we'll move forward then and, and come back to Candace when she joins us. Um, I am new to the commission. I was just appointed this past summer 
And this is my first opportunity to serve as a commission liaison to a rulemaking advisory committee, though I have sat in many of your seats before um, in, my, uh, in my position as the Deschutes County Community Development Director. I live in Bend. Um, I'm really looking forward to working with each of you, our tremendous staff, uh, our very talented consultant team on this project. Uh, Commissioner Stuart Warren, uh, also new to LCDC this, uh, this year, is a co-liaison to the committee. Commissioner Warren serves on the city council in Phoenix, and I believe he's also the council president and, I'll, and on the urban renewal board there. Uh, given the demands of his position pre-wildfire and now in recovery, he will join us and begin participating in early 2021. So a few opening remarks. I believe as stated in the meeting packet that, quote, uh, building climate friendly communities in a way that is inclusive, advances diversity, equity, and inclusion, and promotes affordable living, end quote, is really the most important issue of our time. In DLCD Director Jim Rue's words, quote, uh, climate and housing are one topic with, e with uh, equity at the center, end quote. I agree. And to me, building climate friendly and equitable communities is good land use yeah, and community okay. planning. I think of it um, as planning for vibrant, resilient, and inclusive communities with more housing choices and supply, transportation options, dynamic urban environments, a growing and sustainable economy, the preservation of natural resources and rural landscapes, and so much more. The commission is highly interested in this process and takes this effort very seriously. In fact, I think every commissioner would uh, be very interested in serving as a liaison to this committee. Uh, but as we discussed a couple of months ago, as we um, allocated our, our committee and, and liaison responsibilities, uh, we have many to share. So Commissioner Warren and I have the honor of serving uh, as the liaison uh, to this committee. We're very pleased to do so. As summarized in the meeting packet, our state has enacted and initiated many programs uh, since 2007 to address climate change. Uh, this work, uh, our work, picks up on uh, a rulemaking effort underway in 2018, uh, emphasized by LCDC uh, a year ago in November of 2019, recently amplified by the governor's executive order, which we're gonna uh, talk a little bit more about here very soon, the climate crisis and the growing gap between where we are and where we need to be on greenhouse gas emissions. As we move forward together in this process, I wanna recognize both our experienced RAC members. So many of you have served on uh, rule making advisory committees in the past. Uh, you bring so much to the table uh, from, an in uh, from your in-depth understanding of our statewide planning program. And to our many new members participating for the very first time, you bring equally valuable lived experiences to this process. We have and uh, and we have and so well and regularly demonstrated by our uh, deputy director Kirsten Green and her very inclusive approach uh, that she's really brought to the agency and to all of us um, over the last couple of years moved the table a bit closer to so many more people to participate in this process for the first time. We thank you all for signing up for this important work. You're all uh, so important to our collective success. We know you have much to contribute and we are all genuinely so glad that you're here. With intentionally diverse voices and perspectives at the table, we will strive for a respectful, collaborative and productive tone in our meetings, communications, outcomes and work together. We'll spend a lot of time together over the next year um, and be sure, every, be sure everyone has a range of ways to contribute their voice and perspective. Please remember while this process is advisory to the department, to DLCD, to provide recommendations to the commission, the commission is listening hard for that community voice as well as technical expertise to make changes in how we reshape our communities over time to be more climate compatible and also as importantly to make positive changes in the day in and day out experience of community members' lives. So with that, I thank you again for your time, interest, and commitment to this process and to our state of Oregon. Thank you very much. I'll turn it back over to Sylvia. Thank you, Commissioner. And I'll just spend a few minutes now going over our agenda today. So um, we are we are going to wait a little bit for self introductions from the RAC members until a little bit later in today's agenda. Um, so bear with us as we go through a few more introductory materials for the next about 20 minutes here, 20 or 30 minutes. And in a moment, DLCD staff will give a review of the rulemaking advisory committee's operating principles and guidelines and your charge so that you can really have that common understanding about your role. 
And then we'll get to the heart of the meeting. Um, and as the commissioner stated, really this, this rack is, is meant to be centered on equity. And we wanna hear your thoughts on how to center equity in the process. And so we'll invite all of you at that time to kind of go around the table and reflect on what kind of outcomes you're hoping to achieve through this process. And then the department staff will provide a review of um, climate pollution reduction efforts in the governor's executive order that really led this rulemaking to begin um, and explain parts of the Every Mile Counts effort to just give that common foundation for how various um, efforts on climate work are happening around the state. And also just to note, we hope that you had an opportunity to review the meeting packet in advance of this meeting. You will be getting a pr pretty lengthy meeting packet in advance of all of the meetings with really important pieces. And uh, one critical piece of that packet is a discussion worksheet. So that was on pages six through eight of, of the packet you received for this meeting. And you'll get that something like that in every RAC packet. And these are really just kind of questions to help you gather your thoughts in advance of meetings. Um, and you can also answer those questions in writing. Agency staff will be sending out a kind of fill-in survey after each meeting with those questions to gather more of your input. We know this is just a few hours of your time and you may have much more to contribute than you're able to voice today. Um, and then we have so many people on the rack, so the surveys are an important way to get more of your comments into the process and rack alternates are also welcome to participate in those surveys. And then lastly, before we really get into um, our meeting, just some discussion guidelines. You know, we hope this is a safe and productive space for you all to participate. And so we ask that you seek to honor the agenda. Staff will be seeking to honor the agenda as well. We're also gonna be looking for a balance of speaking time. Um, we appreciate all of the voices in the room today. And if you're a person that tends to say more, we encourage you to give space to others. And if you tend to speak less, um, get brave and, and speak up when you when you have important thoughts to contribute. And we also invite you to have a position of curiosity and understanding and listening um, as we go through this process. There are so many valuable points of view and it'll be really, really critical to listen to one another and really to be tough on the issues and soft on the people. And again, thank you to all the RAC alternates for your participation in these meetings. And we encourage you to participate in those post-meeting surveys and members of the public, we thank you for your participation as well. And uh, note that if you have any comments on the process, we invite you to submit your thoughts via email and that email address is up on the screen. And I think um, uh, DLCD staff can also put it in the chat. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Kevin Young at the agency to provide some introductions of agency staff. Thank you, Sylvia. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Bill, if you wouldn't mind pulling up that PowerPoint, that'd be great. Before I do staff introductions, I do want to read the land acknowledgement. I think it really uh, is helpful in terms of setting uh, the tone for our meeting this morning. So if you'll, if you'll bear with me, I'll, I'll go ahead and read that. I'd like to acknowledge the many tribes and bands who call Oregon their ancestral territory and honor the ongoing relationship between the land, plants, animals, and people indigenous to this place we now call Oregon. We recognize the continued sovereignty of the nine federally recognized tribes who have ties to this place and thank them for continuing to teach us how we might all be here together. Thank you. So uh, I'm Kevin Young. I'm uh, one of the uh, co-project managers uh, for this climate friendly and equitable communities effort. Uh, I'd now like to introduce, introduce Bill Holmstrom, who is the other co-project manager. Uh, Bill is an expert in land use and transportation. Good morning, Bill. Morning, thank you everybody for being here, very excited. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Cody Meyer, who is also a land use and transportation planner, quite expert in scenario planning. He's been working on it for, for many years now. Good morning, Cody. Good morning, everybody. Uh, next up, Matt Crawl is the Planning Services Division Manager, and he provides oversight um, for the DLCD team that is working on this project. Good morning, Matt. Hello. Uh, next, Ingrid Caudell, who probably most of you have already heard from, is handling meeting and administrative support for this effort. Ingrid, in addition to 
sending out packet materials, also is helping to manage the Zoom meeting, and um, is also sending out calendar invites to you. So um, very important member of our team. Good morning, Ingrid. Good morning, everybody. Uh, next up, Casaria Taylor is our rules coordinator. Uh, in addition to helping Ingrid with all of the things that I just described, Casaria also will be keeping us on track um, and making sure that the administrative rules that we develop will ultimately be done timely and in the proper format uh, so that we can accomplish this important task. Good morning, Casaria. Good morning and welcome everyone. Uh, next, uh, Amanda Peets is the director of the ODOT Climate Office. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning, one of our pa partners from ODOT. Good morning. Look forward to working with our sister agency and all of you. And last but not least, Brian Hurley is a member of the ODOT uh, Climate Team as well. Thanks for joining us this morning, Brian. Morning, everyone. Happy to be here. All right. So um, there are other members of the staff team that you will meet over time. These are kind of the, the first folks that you're probably going to encounter, but we will introduce others as we go along. Uh, Bill, could you go ahead and move to the next slide? Oh, thank you. Okay, so you've seen this calendar in your packets um, and I'm not going to belabor it uh, in a lot of detail, but just basically wanna kind of give you a lay of the land in terms of the work that we'll be doing together. We have nine RAC meetings uh, beginning today, November 23rd, and extending through September of next year. Um, we're beginning today really with a focus on this uh, round table to discuss equity outcomes. Um, the next few meetings, we're gonna be talking about regional planning, metropolitan scenario planning, performance measures, et cetera. Um, essentially, this work is about computer modeling and ways in which uh, regions and local governments can look at different actions that they might take in relation to transportation and land use and the impacts in uh, uh, um, climate pollution um, that would result from those actions. So when you hear scenario planning, understand that's, that's really what that exercise is about. We'll be talking about that for the next several meetings. Um, and then in March, uh, we'll review our work. Um, we'll get started talking about concepts for statewide minimum standards. And then we'll take a break for the legislative session because many of our members are engaged at the legislature. Uh, it's important for us to take somewhat of a pause there. Uh, it also provides uh, time for our community listening sessions, uh, focus groups and work groups that we uh, may convene as needed. So after that break, we come back in June. My apologies for the phone. I can't do anything about it at this point. Um, after that break, we come back in June and uh, we will dive into issues related to climate friendly areas and statewide uh, minimum standards that will relate to kind of the land use side of the puzzle. Uh, things like housing, employment uh, and transportation uh, infrastructure that will help to support climate friendly areas and help to uh, meet our uh, climate pollution reduction, goal, uh, reduction goals. Wrapping up hopefully in September, we'll have final rules to review and then we go off to the Land Conservation and Development Commission of which Nick, uh, excuse me, Commissioner Lelac is a member. Uh, our date for that tentatively is November of 2021. Uh, that will be the first hearing and then a uh, possible likely follow-up that may be in December, a second hearing to consider and adopt those proposed rules. All right, uh, next slide, please. Uh, you can go ahead and go on to the next one. Okay, I just wanna speak briefly about the role of the RAC. I think Sylvia's kind of set, set the table a bit on this, but just to be clear, uh, the Rulemaking Advisory Committee, the RAC, uh, the role of the group is to advise staff, okay? Um, it's not a decision-making body. It's not necessary for us to reach consensus. Uh, we're not likely to take votes, although you know we will work towards consensus where we can do that. But really the most important thing that we wish to get from all of our members is uh, all of the perspectives on the table so that we have a full sense of issues and um, 
concerns that you may have and suggestions for improving uh, the rules that we put forward. Uh, we have an incredible group uh, with our, our rulemaking advisory committee who we're expecting to provide input based on both lived and professional experience and knowledge. And we think um, both of those things are very important. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we, um, we are valuing uh, both types of experience. And um, you know, as has been noted, our goal here is to embed equity uh, in the work that we're doing. Uh, the governor's executive order uh, directs us to embed equity considerations in our work to minimize negative impacts on vulnerable communities such as Native American tribes, communities of color, rural communities, coastal communities, low-income households, and other communities that have traditionally been underrepresented in public processes. We want to do a better job of that, and we want to hear from these, these groups and, and many others uh, in the work that we're doing. So what will the RAC be doing? Recommending policies, language, direction to staff. Uh, so it may be very general. It may be once we get down to rule language, you know, specific feedback on this, this works well, this doesn't, et cetera, et cetera. Um, as Sylvia has mentioned, our meetings will be recorded, are subject to open meeting, public record and ethics laws. We will be accepting public testimony, um, written, made, Per potentially verbal uh, at our meetings, depending on how much time we have available. But uh, whatever testimony is submitted to us, we will be sharing with the rulemaking advisory committee. Um, and lastly, I just wanna encourage anyone to any member of the RAC to contact DLCD staff or the project consultant teams with any questions or concerns that you have. All right, next slide, please. So in terms of process and Sylvia's Kind of covered this a, a bit already. Uh, very important to, that we seek to learn and understand each other's perspectives, that we encourage respectful, candid, and constructive discussions in a safe space for everyone. Uh, we seek to resolve differences and find common ground where we can. Uh, let's try to discuss topics together rather than in isolation. And please, uh, if we could all make every effort to avoid surprises, I think that will help us to be most productive in this work. Um, that's what I have to say. I'll now turn it over to Bill to go through the uh, charge to the to the rulemaking advisory committee. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate that. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, the charge today. And um, frankly, I'm not I don't have a lot of I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about it. I'm not going to get into the details of it because we want to make sure we hear from uh, as many of you as we can today during our roundtable. So um, we did talk about it a bit at our uh, webinar, if you've had a chance to read that. And of course, uh, we have the charge uh, in the packet, pages 40 through 44 of the packet. So uh, just overall, the, the, the purpose of the charge is uh, the commission uses the charge to, to guide uh, the work of both us, the, the people at the department, as well as the advisory committee, you, you folks out there. So we wanna make sure that um, you know, we're, we're following within what the, the sideboards that the commission has given us. The commission has defined the work that they want us to accomplish, and it's our job together to flesh it out, figure out the details, and ground that work in, in re the reality that, um, you know, you all represent different pieces of the puzzle. We want to make sure that we're grounding that work appropriately. So, um, just real quick, I want to kind of give the the the, the high level uh, overview of the charge so folks are kind of aware of the different pieces of it. Um, there are four different main parts to the charge, the outcomes, uh, the principles, uh, actions that we will be taking, and then things that we're not doing. And so it's, it's also things that we're not going to do. And because um, sometimes when you say climate, people start thinking about lots of things. And it, it, we're not talking about lots of things. We're talking about a pretty narrow set of things, but a uh, really impactful and important set of things. So the outcomes, and this is on pages 40 through 41 of the packet, and I, I recommend everyone uh, at some point uh, take a very close look at what our proposed, our, our draft outcomes are so that you understand um, what the commission really wants to see out of this process. They're the high level substantive results that the commission wants to see come out of this uh, process. Those are the outcomes and they're really the uh, a super, it's a key to this uh, understanding what we're doing here is to read those outcomes and, and uh, hopefully by the end of this process um, next year, we have some rules that help support those outcomes. 
Uh, the principles are, are considerations that we need to take into um, account when we're putting our rules together. Um, probably a little bit more um, process oriented than, than the substantive uh, outcomes. Um, so take a little bit of time to look at that page 41. Um, and then actions. These are the things that we're actually going to be doing. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we'll have some time to uh, discuss the details of those starting at our next meeting and moving on through the rest of the process about what those look like. And uh, we're going to need some help from you, from all of you to figure out, like, have we got exactly the right mix of things and, you know, doing some tweaking and things like that. But uh, in the large picture, these are the main things that we're going to be doing um, in, in two main categories, and that's um, requiring, I'm sorry, requiring climate friendly and equitable land use and transportation planning and land use regulations, which is a mouthful. But basically, Right now, we have a, a whole set of rules about how we do transportation and land use planning in a coordinated way in Oregon. We've had those for decades, um, they do a lot of good things, um, but as we know, we're, they're not enough and we need to step it up. So that's, that's what that is saying, is we're going to do more in that area and um, you know, have, have additional regulations uh, and written requirements, mostly for local governments for how they will uh, implement uh, these requirements locally. Uh, and then the second big piece is uh, requiring planning for climate pollution reductions in metropolitan areas. Uh, and that's you know, what we're going to be talking about. It's the second on this list, but it's really what we're going to be talking about first in the advisory committee um, starting next meeting. Uh, and that's in, in the metropolitan areas across the state, um, doing some additional things to help uh, uh, make sure that we're meeting particular targets for re reducing our, our climate emissions. So um, again, I'm just a real highlight of, of these, these two things. Um, for this first bit, it's, it's really uh, how we do planning and how these plans are implemented. And uh, we're gonna be touching on each of those pieces, uh, how local governments uh, will do that. And, and I think the key thing is making sure that those rules uh, support our outcomes that are in, are in our charge. And um, in, in our um, packet, uh, you can see, you know, a, a list of a few different uh, kind of categories of actions that we're thinking about for this. Um, that's not to say that that's the complete set of things, but, you know, it's a pretty broad set of actions. So we think most of the things that we know that we need to do are um, contained in there. Um, and then the, the second piece is requiring planning uh, for climate pollution reductions in metropolitan areas. And essentially, this has to do with how the metropolitan areas across the state. And Cody will talk a little bit more about the details of this later this meeting, and we'll be getting into this uh, the next two meetings after this. Um, so I'm not going to talk too much in detail about this, but essentially how um, local governments in, in metropolitan areas across the state will work to, to meet climate pollution targets and report on that progress on an ongoing basis. And then the last piece of the charge is uh, things that we're not doing, and that's page 44. And, and I encourage all of you to take a look at that and see uh, what we're not doing. Um, you know, for example, when we talk about climate, you know, we talk about all the things we can do to reduce emissions, to um, slow uh, the warming processes, but we also need to think about all the things we need to do to respond to the already warming climate and, and the things that are going to happen to us. This process, I think well, there'll be some overlap and there's some actions that kind of get at both, but we're focused on the mitigation. We're focused on reducing those emissions. We're not focused on the adaptation actions. Other pieces of our agency are working on those on a, a, a different level uh, right now in conjunction with other agencies across the state. So that work is happening. It's just not part of this process specifically. So I think there are things that we'll do that will we'll, um, have adaptation elements to them, but that's just an example of something that, you know, when people talk about climate, they think about sea level rise and things like that. And we'll, we'll be maybe planning for um, adapting to some of those things, but that's not the key part of what we're talking about. So page 44, a whole list of things that we're not going, not going to be talking about on this. So um, with that, I think um, I'm going to, oh, I do have a couple more slides. Uh, oh, we're in question and answer part. So I think we just have a few minutes for that and I'll uh, stop my share here. Thanks so much, Bill and Kevin. That's a lot to cover. And hopefully for most of you, that's sort of 
review and a repetition of what you've already learned from um, understanding the process and reading the materials in the past. But we will open it up if anybody has any questions um, that would be useful for the group to hear answers to before we kind of dive into the next part of our agenda. If you have any questions, just go ahead and raise your hand again in the platform, find your raise hand button, or if you're by phone only, press star nine. You can see if there are any questions. Okay, and if not, that's great too. Um, we'll certainly have more time to discuss this as we move forward. So I think with that, we'll move into the next part of our agenda. You are muted. All right. Hopefully that person was not trying to ask a question. If you were, go ahead and maybe ask it in the chat to Casaria and we can read it out loud if needed a little bit later. Okay, so with that, let's head into the next part of our um, of our agenda here, which is really finally hearing from you all. So thank, thanks for bearing with us as we went through the introductions material. So we're gonna move into our round table discussion. And at this point, we're gonna go around the table and, and um, ask you to introduce yourselves and in your introductions, your name, organizations, and feel free to note your preferred personal pronouns if you'd like to, or add your pronouns to um, your name in the Zoom participant list. And then we're gonna ask you to reflect on how to integrate equity into this work. Um, we'll ask you to just think about as we move towards achieving climate goals, how do we do that in an equitable way? And what would that look like on the ground? And the interest here is really in understanding kind of your physical vision of what are the on the ground results. You know, if, if we were to meet these climate goals in an, in an equitable way, how would that look different on the ground from what's happening today? Kind of what are the real tangible outcomes? Um, and so we hope to hear your ideas today and then we'll bring them back to the next rulemaking advisory committee meeting to make sure that we got it right uh, and continue discussion as needed. And so I'll just be going around the table and calling on folks. And we ask that you try to keep your introductions and responses to about two minutes each so that we can hear from all of you. There's 40 RAC members and we really wanna make sure that we hear from everybody in the about an hour and a half that we have for this agenda topic. And we'll try to build in a break too, if we can. Um, and also as you make your comments, feel free to echo what others have said. You know, if you think person XYZ made a great comment, say, I really agree with that. And I want to build build on that um, with these additional notes so that we can kind of see where there's alignment and similar perspectives throughout the group. Um, and just a reminder to stay on mute when you're not speaking and use your video if possible so that we can uh, hear from, so that we can kind of promote that face-to-face -face conversation. And I'm really just going to go around the table and call on folks. If you want to pass, just let me know and, and we can get you later in the queue if, if you're not quite ready to answer um, the questions. Hey, Sylvia. So let's see. I'll call on. Yes, go ahead, Kirsten. Hey, sorry about that. See, I know that um, we had one member who is thrilled to kind of kick us off today who wasn't able to be here. So I just wonder if it'd be possible to ask if anyone else would be willing to volunteer to go first before we surprise anyone at our first meeting with them. Is anyone willing to kick us off? Kirsten, I'm used to going. Great. Uh, looks like oh good, Ken. Thanks. Kirsten, I'm used to going first because my name starts with an A and so in <laughs> Uh, class and school, I would always love it when people would choose Z, uh, but it never happens. So Thank I'm you. Ha I'm happy to go forward. Um, I'm Ken Anderton. Uh, I'm representing the single parent uh, group. Uh, I also have a passion for climate change as well. Um, and I also live, was an early adopter of electric vehicles. Um, and so I have a 12 year old daughter, um, you know, kind of worried about her future. I work a lot with single parents. I hear their struggles every day. And, uh, you know, it, it really is, especially COVID's kind of daylighted uh, a lot, lot of underlying issues of being a, a single parent, a, a one income earner trying to, uh, you know, get kids uh, in daycare that 
a lot of times doesn't exist, uh, especially in uh, COVID, but even prior to COVID, trying to get them, you know, various parts of town and be on to work on time. Um, and so, you know, the, I saw an opportunity to contribute here. I also have a background in real estate. Um, I work uh, for the Port of Portland and lead their real estate development team. Um, and uh, also I uh, participate in a lot of uh, um, volunteer activities with the Urban Land Institute. I'm on the programs committee and uh, just have a passion around transportation and housing. So this seemed like an ideal, ideal way to contribute. Um, also, in my daily work, as well as working with single parents, I, I have given a lot of thought to equity issues. Um, and that daylights as well with uh, single parents, you know, that single parents come in all different types. Uh, and from low income to higher income, different races, etc. And uh, the, the impacts, um, in, in particular, lower income workers, you know, essential workers, is a uh, dramatic right now with COVID, but it's it's been a trend line uh, for a long time that that uh, these parents are struggling and they need help and and they need to be uh, taken into account when land use planning decisions and transportation planning de decisions are made. So that's kind of me in a, a nutshell. Um, is that what you're looking for? I think it is, but also can the yeah, equity perfect. outcomes. Yep, so folks can write Sylvia, so you're doing intro, but also what you hope to see on the ground, what's important to you from your perspective. Sorry, I will promise to be mostly, if not all on mute today. Okay, well, I appreciate the coaching there. Um, in outcomes, I'm, I'm hopeful, actually there's a robust discussion about this topic, because I think everyone here brings something different to the table, understands through their lived experiences and their professional experiences something. And so I'm ho hopeful we get in daylight, uh, you know, these these uh, concepts and concerns out there, so we can make broad recommendations and and uh, can think of different different avenues to impact equity in our in our decisions that aren't going to last a generation. So I would my my hope here is that we're able to generate a list of recommendations that. Uh, are thinking about all the different population that this will impact. And we understand what those ramifications are because there's always, unfortunately, there's a lot of times winners and losers in land use planning and, and uh, you know policy planning. And it's helpful to understand who's benefiting and who's being burdened uh, by these decisions. Thank you, Ken, that's really helpful. And I'm just going to share um, a quick PowerPoint slide with a reminder of what our questions are for the roundtable introductions. Try to do limited PowerPoint when we're in these conversations, but this might be helpful. And then we'll put those questions in the chat as well as a reminder. And um, so next in our queue, I'm going to go to Sarah. I know that Sarah has to leave a little bit early today, so we'll go to Sarah. And then um, next, I think we can go to Amy with the NAACP. Um, Alma Flores with REACH CDC and uh, Mallory Roberts with the Association of Oregon Counties, if you want to get ready. All right, so Sarah, let's head to you and just remind your name, your affiliation, and just talk about um, what kind of equity outcomes you would like to see from this process. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to, uh, I just want to thank everyone for being, being here for this work. Um, Excuse me. So I use a she and her, but I'm fine with them also. Um, and I'm Sarah Adam Shane. Uh, I am on the board of uh, Housing Land Advocates, and I'm also a professor at the U University of Oregon School of Law, where I teach land use, um, ocean and coastal law. And um, <laughs> I've seen some O's in the audience, and um, and uh, 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 state and local government law. And I write a lot on. Um, climate resilience, uh, climate justice, and housing justice. Um, so this is like, I'm just so happy to be here. Uh, so I also though, I also am, was born in Oregon and I grew up in Oregon. And I, I actually, I grew up, um, you know, I think maybe uh, unlike the stereotype of a law professor probably, and unlike most of the law professors I knew, I grew up in poverty. My, my family was uh, housing and food insecure. Um, and I feel, uh, privileged and fortunate to not to not be 
housing or food insecure at this point in time, but I think it really drives my, um, well, it's driven my whole life and it drives my, my passion for, uh, you know, housing justice and, and climate justice. Um, and, and in terms of the, the question as, of as we move toward achieving climate goals and uh, how do we do that in an equitable way, what would that look like on the ground? Um, I, a few things really uh, came, you know, came up for me in that area. One is that for every policy decision we make as a group, I understand our decisions are recommendations, not, not, um, you know, not, a, you know, not policy decisions exactly, but for every policy recommendation we make as a group, I think that that means that we ask the question, does this recommendation further oppressive systems or does it further dismantling of oppressive systems? Um, so that's one. And then, you know, as we do that and thinking about, and, and some of these things are really already reflected in the RAC materials, but thinking about participation and having, you know, a truly deeply participatory process, um, you know, I'm so glad to, to hear, you know, uh, Ken, that he's here representing single parents I and mean, what a fantastic, you know, um, voice to include. So that really deeply participatory process. Um, and within that context, you know, one thing I think, you know, working in well, any sector, it doesn't matter what sector, like challenging our internal belief that people who are affected by the decisions we make actually have the wisdom to solve the problems. Right. And I personally, I think that that takes like some pretty deep work to believe that on a deep level um, and to work as a collaborator and not top down. Um, and then kind of really on the ground, what do I think this looks like? You know, that kind of participation to me, that kind of equity uh, framework to me is, is um, collaboration, you know, truly diverse collaboration at every stage, planning, implementation, assessment, going back to planning, like every stage and not just some early form of planning. And then we go back to, you know, the people who are typically uh, in power, um, you know, moving the ball forward. And then I, I know it's outside of, this, of the scope of this, this um, rack, but I think because of the, you know, massive, you know, disparate impact of climate related risks on, you know, all, all kind of vulnerable and marginalized populations, um, I do think, you know, even if we're not creating an adaptation strategy, which I understand we're not, we have to be asking for every, you know, decision we make there too, you know, what, what are these, what are the risks related to this decision? And, you know, can we, um, you know, address those risks or mitigate them? I, I don't think we can separate that out completely from what we're doing here. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. That's really great. Really appreciate that. Um, and Amy. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, my name is Amy Okotelia Khan. Um, I'm a student at the University of Oregon. I'm a graduate student in environmental studies and community and regional planning. Um, and I'm also an employee at the NAACP Eugene Springfield unit. Um, so I work with their environmental and uh, climate justice committee um, and so really really cool and excited to be here this is my first time kind of being in this in, in this sort of space and contributing to this effort so it's really new and I'm hoping, hoping this will be um, a learning opportunity for me I'm going to use she her pronouns as well um, and so um, the question that was posed um, for me I really think about um, this kind of notion that like you know, technology will, you know, save our souls and save all of us. And, and so, you know, as we're um, electrifying and, and switching over to renewables, you know, I'm really interested in this concept of a just transition um, and just making sure that as we're, you know, using um, and looking towards um, technological advancement um, as a climate mitigation strategy that, you know, we're not leaving out those communities that are, um, disproportionately burdened by climate change impacts. Um, and so there was um, also something within the, um, the welcome packet that stood out to me. Um, it was the um, 2018, I think, STS report. And it was talking about how carbon and other negative externalities 
um, have not been priced and have not been um, um, taken account account for. So um, to me, just really understanding all of those invisible negative externalities of transportation and our energy sector, um, especially the international um, components. Um, my family's from Nigeria, so I'm always thinking about home and how it's not safe for me to go home. Some people can just kind of like pick up and, and go back to where they came from, and it's just simply not not safe for me to do so. And so I liked how um, the welcome packet had that section about housing and, and talked about, um, you know, us thinking about where is Oregon, Oregon's place in the international community. Um, so not just thinking about um, the impacts that we're having here in Oregon, but Oregon in relation to the rest of the world. Um, and so for me, that thinks about um, sourcing, product sourcing, um, especially with cars and electric vehicles, um, a lot of the um, conflict materials that are used in electric vehicles, you know, come from countries in Africa um, where people are, um, their labor um, are being ex exploited um, to produce those materials. So again, just thinking about those negative externalities that are not being um, accounted for. Um, and then also um, just really forming relationships and mending relationships, like the field of planning has really scarred communities of color to the point where there's just like a real really there's just a lack of trust um, with people with any kind of like government affiliation so just really getting to know the communities that we're working with on the ground and forming those relationships and mending those relationships as well um, and then using non non-monetary um, indicators of success I think the western world is used to using things like GDP um, and things like that so just, you know, are people happy? You know, it's not always about money, um, but yeah, again, just using non-monetary non indicators of um, success and progress. Thank you. Thanks so much, Amy. Um, and Alma, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, Alma Flores, um, she, her, a, yeah, pronouns. Um, I am the Director of Housing Development for REACH Community Development Corporation. Um, a local nonprofit that builds affordable housing in the tri-county bi-state area. Um, I love what you had to say, Amy and Sarah. Uh, it's hard to follow two great responses to your question, um, but I will do my best. Uh, so having uh, lived in Oregon for almost 17 years, but grew up in Los Angeles, uh, much of sort of the housing options were based on redlining. My family was, as you can imagine, discriminated as many other Latinos were in uh, Los Angeles and throughout the nation. Uh, so we were forced to live in areas that I don't think we, you know, we were meant to be necessarily, but brokers decided our fate uh, and banks. And so I think um, what I try to do at REACH is to build, um, housing that's people centered. So what we're uh, attempting to do is lead with racial equity in the design and development of our future projects. And what that takes is an understanding at the grassroots level what people need, not have it be driven by funders, uh, both the banks and state and federal programs, uh, but actually what people need and, des and uh, desire intergenerational housing uh, senior, whatever it might be, but have it be based on grassroots level uh, indications from a people centered approach. I think that to me is how um, within both transportation, land use and economic development, those intersections are so important to how we, um, you know, build and how we meet uh, sort of other objectives that the state has in terms of increased housing to to reflect that need as well as economic opportunities um, and then transportation intersecting both. Uh, I think it's critical that we are intentional in that development, that it's born of the people um, and that it's it's tailored. So for me, rulemaking, I mean, I have to come to terms with it because it's looking at it statewide, but in many, many times in my work, I'm always thinking strategically on a place-based method where there needs to be strategies and tailored approaches to both mitigate um, gentrification and prevent displacement in communities. When we do all of these investments or we think about the investments that need to come as they relate to climate, 
Uh, my worry uh, is that they aren't going to be equitable, and I'm glad to be part of this group uh, to help inform that. And, and much of it stems from the fact that when you build infrastructure, uh, it tends to uh, gentrify, gentrify an area or uh, cause displacement. So I want to be a voice advocating for anti-displacement measures uh, when those programs, projects, and outcomes come to life. Um, I have, I believe in a collaborative approach and I love this group and what it's meant to do. And um, Amy hit it on the, <laughs> the head on the nail, um, or nail on the head, um, when it comes to collaboration and making sure that we factor in unintended co consequences as well, um, that we've thought through what the outcomes are going to be. And we, um, I would love to see us tailor our approach and strategize and out the outcomes to reflect different uh, demographics, uh, different uh, racial, ethnic, cultural nuances that play into this. Um, it's super important not to put a um, cookie cutter approach to uh, what we're trying to achieve here. Um, and I think uh, we can get there for sure with this group. Um, and then of course it needs to be balanced with sort of the environmental concerns um, and um, along with uh, equity and environmental, uh, sorry, economic. Um, and so, yeah, I think I, I can stop there. Thanks. Thanks, Alma. Uh, and next, let's go to Mallory and just queuing up the next set of folks. Folks, let's go then to um, Jairag Singh with Unite Oregon. And again, apologies if I mispronounce your name. Um, as we learn each other's name, I'll, I'll be sure to note any pronunciation for the future. Uh, and then Laquita Lanford and then Shane Whitman, just to be ready to speak. So go ahead, Mallory. Thanks, I'm Mallory Roberts um, with the Association of Oregon Counties. I'm a Legislative Affairs Manager for Transportation and Community Development. Great to see a lot of familiar local government faces on here today. Um, and I guess as you know, sort of representative for Oregon's 36 counties, what I'm looking for, and I'll piggyback on pretty much everything that was said already, um, especially it's something that Alma mentioned, you know, the, the cookie cutter approach being problematic. So what I'm thinking about is making sure that this good work is implementable across all of our counties. So urban, rural, coastal, frontier counties, local governments that will put this um, this work into action. Um, I'm just really looking forward to getting to know everyone here and, um, and working together to come up with something that works for the state. Thank you, Mallory. Really appreciate that. Um, and Jairaj, are you on the line? Yes. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jairaj Singh. I use uh, they and he pronouns. Um, I am the Senior Environmental Justice Manager um, at Unite Oregon. Um, I really want to echo and uplift what uh, Amy has said. I think um, in order to achieve uh, climate goals, we need to build trust with and center um, frontline and fenceline communities. These are typically uh, BIPOC communities that are impacted first and worst from the consequences of climate change on the ground. I think this looks like creating safe, um, accessible um, intercultural spaces, not only for sustainable and equitable engagement, but also to access services in, in a holistic and comprehensive manner so this includes spaces to educate folks on climate resiliency, um, especially on adaptation, uh, green workforce development, and how to navigate dominant culture institutions and bureaucracies, uh, really to, I think, eventually help communities access critical resources and or be a part of decision-making processes. Thank you so much, really appreciate that. And Laquita Lampert. Good day, everyone. Good morning, happy Monday. Um, yeah, everyone said some really amazing um, thoughts to the questions. My name is Laquita Lanford and I go by she, her pronouns, uh, or you guys can call me Q. Um, I represent the homeless, 
Research, Action, and Collaborative over at Portland State University. This will be my second, um, second learning experience working with the land use conservation uh, department folks. So I'm really excited to be coming in at an earlier stage to work on these uh, equity, equity engagement conversations. Um, I would say for me um, with equity and it being on the ground, something that our last um, friend said about, you know, just the educational um, components and where we're at right now during this time of COVID, how we're not doing much community engagement in these processes and possibly, you know, have the idea that, you know, we, we, we're still dealing with the digital divide when it comes to getting information out to the community and folks not having access to um, devices to get in this information or put it, you know, giving their input. So just thinking about how we could utilize our um, current, like what we have current in our public transportation, um, because people are still taking public transportation to get more awareness out about the work that we're doing. And I, I do agree on the, um, the aspects around uh, the displacement and gentrification that has taken place in the last 15 years. I think we've had most people in my community are a little exhausted and worn out from those conversations. So the trust of, you know, moving forward and looking at how we bring another piece to the pu um, public and to the puzzle around uh, equity, because equity is not a new terminology that folks are using. It's just, it's repetitively being uh, utilized. And so how we utilize this uh, term in this space and what we want to accomplish, uh, you know, being on the ground. I also represent the houseless community. Uh, I've worked as a housing advocate for the last, um, possibly all my life, but professionally um, the last seven years. Uh, I've worked with Urban League of Portland. I've worked on I work in food justice work and climate justice work as well. So I'm a baby. I'm still growing and learning professionally. And uh, this is, I feel like this is a really great space to continue my um, growth and, and development as I uh, work out and work with uh, my moving project that I'm working with with Portland State called an Afro Village Tiny Home Similar Community and a model around these, these specific issues that we're, that we're touching on in the next nine months. So it will give me um, some, you know, how do I implement this while I'm implementing and developing, I believe in the planning of the planning process is the very much is a very important process and having those voices at the table at the beginning and not at the end of, of these terms in which we <clears throat> are looking for because this is not new information. We look back at all of the, you know, the amount of years that it took for us to get here to this day. And so my interest also is working with younger, uh, younger folks so that they get this information that to move their lives in the continuation of what it is that we are aiming to do. So thank you. Thanks so much, Laquita. And let, next, let's go to Shane with the city of Kaiser. And I'll just call our next set of speakers that we invite to, to go after that. Um, so Bandana, and then Julie Warnke, and um, Leanne O'Neill, Mari Valencia Aguilar, and Vivek Shandas, and Zach Geary. We'll, we'll repeat that again when we get a little bit closer. But um, Shane, please go ahead. Thank you, Sylvia. Yeah, my name is Shane Witham. I am the interim community development director for the city of Kaiser. Um, I go by he and him pronouns. And I wish that I had a amazing answer for this question. I feel like you guys just dropped like the huge million dollar question on us right in meeting one. Um, but I would I would echo some of the things said earlier. Um, definitely um, I am hopeful that this rulemaking process doesn't result in that cookie cutter approach 
to rules that govern our transportation planning. Uh, I love the I love the fact that we're looking a little bit better, I think, with the, the interrelationship between transportation and housing, because um, clearly that's a huge piece. Um, and, and I think, you know, and as, as, I, as I considered, you know, what does that look like on the ground? In my community, we're in a, a suburban community. We're in kind of the, other than Metro, the only shared urban growth boundary with City of Salem, which Julie's going to talk in a couple people. I heard her name called. She's much smarter than me and has been a transportation planner forever. So hopefully she has some magic um, fixes to things. But, but I think the, the good news is, is that uh, clearly with um, the movement towards recognition of needing to address climate change and, and meeting those climate goals and connecting those to transportation and housing elements, I think there's a recognition at that state level and that all of us see that the road that we've currently paved isn't getting us where we need to go. And so looking at, I guess from my end, hope, hoping to be able to create um, a set of rules that doesn't just further that disparity that's been created in the past. Um, and, and I think one of, the, one of the elements that I'm very intrigued to see what comes out of is how those scenario planning elements will drive how investments are being made in our transportation systems. Because um, I know at least in our community, um, going by a simple, you know, how long you have to wait at an intersection or how congested a road gets and that prioritize where the investments get made um, does not help those communities and areas where folks are already underserved. And so I, I would hope out of the rulemaking process, we would see some movement towards kind of aligning those investments. Uh, so I hope hopefully I answered the question well enough, but uh, excited to be here. This is my first rack, so I'm I'm definitely learning. And I, I know uh, uh, Laquita had mentioned she was a baby in this process. Uh, me too, me too, Laquita. So um, I'm definitely um, wanting to learn and hopefully be able to input some things that are of value. So thank you. Thank you, Shane. Welcome to, to your first rulemaking process. Um, and Bandana. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Bandana. Um, Shrestha, I'm the Director of Community Engagement for AARP Oregon, and I'm really pleased to be here. This is my second uh, rack, and um, I still feel like a baby. I'll probably feel like a baby for a long time because I'm always learning, and uh, I always like to say, you know, I, I guess at some point I'll have, I won't be able to say I, I'm still learning and, um, but definitely I'm not a policy wonk or a practitioner in planning like a lot of you are. I come from a place of uh, both in my career at ARP and previously of really um, uh, looking at people powered solutions uh, and uh, engaging people in sort of uh, creating the kind of future they want. And that's what I do here at ARP. We're a membership organization of people 50 plus. So I'm thinking about aging all the time and uh, that's sort of the perspective I bring into um, the work today uh, in, in this uh, effort. Um, you know, equity, uh, you know, and I also happen to be, of course, um, a person of color, an immigrant. I live in Clackamas. I have a son. I'm thinking about his future. Um, and I'm thinking about me getting older too, and all of us getting older. Hopefully, we'll all get to get older. And uh, one thing we know that is that uh, you know um, we really do need to take an intersectional approach, and hopefully also a lifespan approach as we think about the policies that we're making. Um, uh, you, you know, we all we probably know, but maybe we don't that there's this whole idea of how um, you know this cumulative disadvantages. Um, as we grow older, uh, and if we are a person of color, if you're poor, if you are immigrant, there all these things kind of impact how you live your life, what your lived experience is going to be like. Um, so, you know, and, um, but at the same time, there is also research that shows that age becomes an equalizer um, as we grow older. So in some ways there is an opportunity, um, I feel to um, really look for, uh, creating a future that benefits us all um, at every, you know, whatever background we come from. So I really encourage us to look, take a lifespan approach as we think about uh, equity, 
um, I see that in my work, you know, climate change and the conversions of population aging um, really comes um, really harshly when there is a disaster, for instance. What happened in, uh, for instance, in Jackson County, the fires, the wildfires, the floods, whenever um, there's some sort of a incident that takes place in our communities, we, we know that older adults, people of color, lower income people are impacted. And I appreciated uh, what was said by Kevin that, you know, the folk, or actually it was Bill who said it, uh, the focus of this rack is really about uh, reduction um, and mitigation rather than adaptation. But I'm hoping that as we think about what happens as a result of, uh, and what equity, or, you know, um, what uh, the impact of this, our work collectively uh, will look like on the ground is that we're not only foc focused on reducing harm, but really also creating opportunity. A lot of what has, uh, was said by Amy and others about, uh, you know, looking at uh, preventing displacement, um, all those things, but also creating opportunity truly. And that, that benefit of, uh, you know, that we may be able to impart for future generations uh, throughout our, you know, whatever age we are, I think uh, is a powerful opportunity. I'm glad to be here with you today. And I hope that uh, we all, uh, I will get to benefit from the very, very smart people's thinking uh, and learn and contribute uh, to it. And I'm excited that I have my colleague, uh, Patricia Selinger here uh, with me, who's going to serve as my second. Uh, Patricia, I don't see you, but thanks for being here. That's it. Thank you, Vandana, and also to Patricia. I appreciate that. And um, let's go to Julie, and then Leanne will be next. Hi, I'm Julie Thank Warnicke. You. I'm sorry, is this the right Julie? Okay. <laughs> um, Julie Warnicke, I'm the Transportation Planning Manager for the City of Salem and the Public Works Department. And um, I was on the RAC back in 2017, 2018, um, and I'm pretty familiar with a lot of these issues. I am looking forward to this effort. Um, I feel that it's a much broader um, rulemaking advisory committee, which I appreciate. Um, I guess what, you know, what, I'm, what I see with equity is, uh, is really on the ground is gonna be flexibility because what is appropriate in Salem is, you know, or in certain parts of Salem may not be the same thing that's appropriate in Portland or in Eugene or Grants Pass or, um, you know, Ontario, you know, so, and I'm just naming sort of urban areas, um, let alone the rural areas. And so the, the ability to hear from our, um, community members and respond to their needs is going to require that we have flexibility at the local government level so that we can implement something that is equi equitable from the lens of our community. Um, and then, uh, yeah, that's, I guess, what I have to say. I really appreciated what um, Alma had to say and also Mallory. Thanks, Julie. And Leanne? Great, thank you. Uh, my name is Leanne O'Neill. I use she and they pronouns, and I own a small equity and social justice consulting firm in Bend. And I'm also here primarily in my role as the president of the Board of Bend Bikes, which is a grassroots nonprofit that advocates for the safety of people on bikes. Uh, I'm also a recovering attorney that brings perspective of working as an advocate for survivors of domestic violence and access to justice. Um, I'd really like to see a shift away from the idea that we're saving vulnerable communities and traditionally underrepresented folks and really explicitly acknowledge that it's exclusion and oppression within a, within an equity framework that's based more on social justice, which means really intentional rulemaking and redistribution of resources to remedy that historical exclusion and oppression. So I've got a lot of concerns around on the ground resources to implement anything that comes out of the rack here locally. Um, outcomes on the ground uh, kind of speaking from my Ben Bikes hat, um, our transportation systems are designed for cars. So for on the ground, that means shifting our transportation system to actually prioritize people who walk, bike, roll, people with limited mobility. 
And at the intersection of equitable housing and transportation, uh, we'd really like to see that equitable and affording housing options like ADUs, micro units, low income housing aren't relegated to the outskirts of the urban growth boundary so that black indigenous people of color, LGBTQ folks and lower income folks aren't subject to longer commutes, which makes them vulnerable in our transportation system for longer. It can also take away their transportation options, especially somewhere like Ben that has a really awful um, uh, public transportation system because it runs like once every 40, 50 minutes. Um, and I'd like just to echo um, that I really agree with Amy's comments around the non-dominant culture metrics um, and really support what um, Jairak and uh, Jairaj and Laquita had to say as well. Thank you. Thanks so much, Leanne. Um, and next we'll go to Mari with Washington County and then Vivek, Shandas, and Zach Geary. Do we have Mari on the Hi. line? Uh, sorry, technical issues. Ho hopefully you all can hear me now. Um, great, head nods. <laughs> um, I'm uh, Mari Valencia Aguilar. I use she, her, ella pronouns. Um, I am a housing and community development specialist at Washington County Office of Community Development. Um, that is the hat that I'll be wearing my affiliation. Um, in terms of the equity, I've heard a lot of really great things. Leanne, Amy, Diraj, many others, Alma. Y'all, um, I mean, I could echo everything you say. I think for me, if I can build on that um, in terms of the conversation ar around equity and specifically the subject matter that consists of climate, transportation, housing, I think one, it's important, and maybe someone else did mention this, that we continue, that we acknowledge how this planning profession has been so oppressive to BIPOC communities, recognizing that and, and not leaving that is critical to um, really understanding how the, the planning work of our past has been harmful and, and making sure at all ways that we undo this harm. Um, and so instantly I was gravitated to the outcomes that were in, in, in the packet. And so for me, I look at number three and I, and it says support affordable, healthy living by developing actions that reduce transportation costs and increase. So the questions that I'll be asking, and I hope that we all ask too, is what does affordable housing mean for BIPOC people? Um, recognizing that they've been so harmed by past planning at, um, policies and land use and all of that, what does safety really mean for BIPOC people? Um, what does the transport transportation system um, mobility mean for BIPOC people? Um, so I'll leave it there. Um, a lot of people have said really good things um, and that's just where my, my thinking is at. Thank you. Thanks so much, really helpful. And Vivek? Hello, everybody. It's good to be here. Nice to see some familiar faces. My first rack as well. So um, uh, Vivek Chandas, he, him, his. And um, at, I'm at Portland State University as uh, somebody who does work on climate adaptation. My area is not in transportation or housing, at least the way we organize um, the, the university. Um, I just in response to the question, I mean, amazing. I'm taking so many notes from what folks are saying. This is exactly the kind of conversation I was hoping we would have in part because I'm getting increasingly convinced that the systems that created a lot of this historical inequities haven't changed very much. And we really need to this particular conversation to move the needle on um, the, the historic um, and current challenges that I think um, we face, especially with a pernicious and acute effect, effects of climate change that we're seeing play out every day. Um, I would just, I mean, my main thing is I, I, I just think it comes down, boils down for me to these two issues of reducing exposure and increasing 
uh, or strengthening the capabilities and coping capacities of communities, and particularly those communities that we're many of us are, I think, identifying here, whether they be um, Black, Indigenous, um, Latinx communities, Asian communities, Middle Eastern communities, um, and Pacific Islander communities. I mean, these are the communities that have been historically uh, oppressed in the country, and I think what we want to do is bring a state that uh, bring. Um, the state of Oregon to a place where we can really engage and support community-based organizations that are working at the intersection of, um, at least where I work, climate and health. Um, I think building networks and um, providing resources to communities that are working at the front line on some of these issues. And of course, lifting up examples. I'd love to hear uh, and learn about examples of what is working in this field and what are you seeing coming down um, in terms of the effective approaches for dismantling some of the systems that have created this in the first place and, re and revising, recreating systems that would allow us to be um, really centering, um, centering communities that have been historically oppressed and um, currently face a lot of these impacts from climate. So grateful to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I have a, um, an alternate, Rebecca Lewis, who I'll probably be going back and forth with and being in close contact with during the um, RAC meetings. Thanks. Thank you, Vivek. And Zach, before you introduce yourself, I'm just call our next set of folks to be ready to go. Um, that'll be Cassie Lacey and Hue Ong, uh, Michael Sporluck and Noel Johnson. And so Zach, go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. Can you hear me? Oh, excellent. Oh, there's a lot of head nods. That was fun. Um, I'm Zach Geary, city of McMinnville, um, elected city councilor two years in. Uh, before that, I was on the McMinnville Planning Commission, uh, vice chaired that for a couple of years. And um, have, I grew up here in McMinnville, left for a couple of years to go to the University of Oregon and came back and have, uh, found work and am raising my family here. My lovely wife, Samantha, works for the public library here in McMinnville, which is a three block walk from our house. I, my office is just a couple blocks away from our house and um, we've got parks and amenities within a walking distance. And so I feel really fortunate. Um, my son, Hiram, is four years old. Um, and he's enjoying exploring everything. Um, professionally, I'm a general contractor and I specialize more in residential construction and in fact, green and sustainable um, construction design and techniques. I've been a part of LEED certified buildings, both commercial and residential, as well as uh, had a unique opportunity to be a part of a passive house built here in McMinnville. Um, so, so that's kind of my professional expertise. Um, I, I guess the community I represent is probably just boring middle of the road dads um, in Oregon. So um, if anyone needs a joke break, I may be able to re look up one. Um, as far as equity outcomes, I'm glad I'm not, um, I'm glad that there's this community or this group, um, as I've heard everyone before me, um, uh, sounds like a really uh, intelligent group of people, both um, mentally as well as emotionally. And so, um, I'm, I'm going to do more listening on this than I am anything else. Um, and hopefully I can be helpful where I can. I think, um, putting the thumb on the scale for, um, to get, to get the uplift, the, the groups of people we've identified here more in the table and more, more, uh, of more success as Oregon's land use planning machine keeps driving forward. I know the city of McMinnville is, we're right now ready to go at our, um, our UGB remand process again, which we're way delinquent on. I see some staff nodding of heads. Um, we'll see you in a little while. But uh, as we as we go forward, I think yeah, um, being able to hear real examples and and put the thumb on the scale for to get the environment at the table, who doesn't have a spokesperson, and a lot of those communities that have been um, downtrodden from the land use planning process, um, get them at the table. And I also really liked the term that Amy had for. Uh, recognizing non-monetary indicators of success and that importance in the group. So um, that's all. Thank you very much. Looking forward to being a part of it. Thank you, Zach. And Lacey. I'm yeah. sorry, Cassie Lacey. It's, it's okay. Um, my name is Cassie Lacey. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a senior management analyst in the city manager's office for the city of Bend. I lead our climate planning for the city. Um, and for me, I think ensuring that um, 
uh, we achieve climate goals in an equitable way means that we're creating really actions and processes so that in our local planning and implementation of these rules, we're centering input from our most underrepresented community members and community members that are most impacted by climate change um, so that we can really know what's gonna be the best for our community spe specific needs and that our outcomes improve the quality of life for our most vulnerable community members rather than increase gentrification like has been mentioned. And um, as a lot of people have noted that there is a great need to build trust between those community members and the government agencies in order to do that effectively. And that's something that's certainly true in Bend and something that we are uh, actively trying to improve, but, but I think we still have a long way to go. And so from everyone's responses, I think that there's a lot of individuals in this group that we can learn a lot about how best to do that. So I'm really looking forward to that. And then I think um, as far as some of the important tangible outcomes on the ground, um, I think uh, some of the things that, that, I, that I feel like we're really focusing, focused on is just ensuring that everyone in our community can afford a comfortable and safe home in a location that allows them to be climate friendly. So maybe a home where they don't need to be out reliant on a vehicle um, and a home that uses energy in a way that is efficient and uh, affordable to live in over time. And certainly in Bend, the places where it's easy to live um, without a personal vehicle, for example, are some of the most expensive places in town. So how can we kind of turn the dial on having better distribution on things like that? And Leanne, who's um, from Bend Bikes and also from Bend, uh, kind of described that a little bit better than I did. But so I think that's definitely something that's a problem here and something we're trying to remedy. And as we think about climate planning, um, that's those types of issues are are really forefront of my mind. And then I think also just making sure that um, as we kind of help increase options for people, making sure that our vulnerable community members just have multiple options for what kind of home they live in and the way that they get around that in a way that's climate friendly so that everyone can have that kind of autonomy based on what works for their life. You know, it can't just be like a, it's the solution isn't just one way. It needs to work for as many people as possible. And then last, just echoing what um, some other local government uh, representatives have said about flexibility and implementation so that we can implement in a way that does make sense for our community um, and also get some support for how we can implement while engaging locally our community members that are underrepresented so we can kind of come up with those community specific equity strategies. Thank you, Kathy. And Hue? Good morning, folks. My name is Hui Ong. I use he, him uh, pronouns. I'm the executive director of Opal Environmental Justice Oregon. I'm an alternate for Lee Helfland, who will be part of this advisory committee. Uh, they, have, they have a much needed break. Uh, OPAL organizes uh, low-income communities and communities of color to achieve a healthy and safe uh, environment where we work, live, play, and practice spirituality. Uh, we primarily organize transit-dependent communities in the Portland metro area and a heavy focus on uh, East Portland and both in the schools and in the communities that are underserved by uh, our transportation investments and uh, planning. Um, just want to echo a lot of amazing thoughts and comments from folks that have already shared. Uh, Laquita, Jayraj, Leanne, uh, Vivek, Vandana, Mari all said amazing things that I would absolutely agree with. Uh, one addition for our work uh, as we organize communities that have historically been not engaged in a lot of these decision-making processes because of the broken trust over decades um, of planning and, and land use um, is as an advisory committee, we are oftentimes limited to actual decision-making and we don't articulate the tension around how the power dynamics are actually set up in these processes. Um, and at the end of the day, a lot of time and investment is put in from our communities into these processes with great expertise from around this table. And it gets to a, a decision-making table that then we are absolutely not having um, a seat at the table, right? And that becomes a challenge in uh, both the repair of uh, trust in the community as we're trying to implement these policies in the, what folks else what other folks also shared in terms of the flexibility on the ground of how these policies actually get implemented uh, because we've seen those that actually have power 
um, ends up oftentimes having impact. And we've seen it in different processes around um, air quality, disparate impact, um, and investment. So sometimes the biggest um, uh, cause of our climate crisis are the ones that ends up having a lot of power at the end of the day to actually implement their own uh, rules. So something to be mindful of as we are thinking about how do we engage different agencies, different uh, actors and players um, in this process, and then have it roll out uh, on the ground in a way that's meaningful and centers the lived experience of uh, frontline communities. Thank you. Thank you so much, really appreciate that. And next let's go to Michael and then Noel Johnson. So Michael, go ahead. Hi, and uh, good morning, everyone. It's nice to be a part of this process. Um, and there's, there's a lot that's already been said, a lot of ground to cover. Um, so I, I use personal pronouns he, him, um, and I self-identify as a person with a disability uh, from birth. And that is my main sort of area of focus professionally in the last 12 years of my life. Um, and, you know, the only time that people with disabilities are mentioned as, uh, as, as a group, we are uh, in lists of so-called vulnerable people. And, I, and, and actually also often we don't even appear in those lists. So we're completely forgotten about. And so I really appreciate what uh, Bandana mentioned about the need to take an intersectional approach. We absolutely need to recall and always that people are not just monolithic identities. We have multiple identities. Many people experience multiple discrimination based on ethnicity, sexual orientation, race, um, religion, et cetera. Um, so that's one, I think, very important point that I've heard. Also, uh, Leanne mentioned um, several things that I thought were extremely important. Um, one of which was that we shouldn't be seen just as vulnerable communities. We are made vulnerable because the system has not worked for us. We are not, you know, per se vulnerable. And so if we want to no longer be seen as vulnerable, we really need to shift how this whole process works and also shift how we uh, measure outcomes. What, what, what has changed on the ground for uh, people with disabilities in rural communities that are living in poverty, that are ethnic minorities or racial minorities? They have never been included in these dialogues. I'm pretty confident. Um, so that's one set of things about the process. When we talk about when we talk about outcomes, when we look at the issues around housing, we need to understand that affordable housing isn't the right lens. What we need is adequate housing, which includes multiple elements. I shared, and I believe it was included in the packet, uh, a, a short document that lists seven elements of housing. And we need to think about all of those. Where are houses located? What access to transportation and services do people living in those homes have? Um, are they uh, inhabitable in the sense of enough space for a family to live in? Um, are they accessible for people with disabilities and older people? There's, there's, there's a lot there that needs to really, um, that we need to pay attention to. With regards to transportation, I think, um, you know, Leanne and, and, and Mari both mentioned issues around accessibility and mobility, um, making sure that our built environment can be used by everyone. Finally, with regards to employment, we need to understand that people with disabilities, regardless of race, gender, sexual orientation, et cetera, have much lower rates of high school graduation, participation in vocational training, participation in, 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 in higher education, 
um, and are, are therefore less equipped to be in the open job market competitive with others who do not have those um, identity markers or characteristics. So I, I'm mindful of not wanting to take too much time. So I will leave it at that. So, and thank you for uh, enabling me to be part of this conversation. Thanks, Michael. It's really helpful to hear. And next we have Noel. And before we go to Noel Johnson, just want to um, bring up our next set of speakers and just a reminder of what we're talking about today, because I think we do have a few new folks that have joined. So here in our round table, we're asking you to just introduce yourself, your name, organization, your role or interest in this work. And then thinking about um, integrating equity into the work of this rulemaking. Folks are responding to, as we move towards achieving climate goals, how do we do that in an equitable way? What would that really look like on the ground? And um, all of this input on sort of what the vision would look like in the future if this is done equitably, um, measures of success, all of that are, are really helpful as we move forward. And we'll put those questions in the chat again. So after we hear from Noel, I think our next set of speakers that we'll call on will be Bill with the Oregon School Board and um, Candace Jimenez and then Kyle McAdam and uh, Oriana Magnera. So Noel, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Sylvia. Uh, my name is Noel Johnson and I'm representing the Oregon Smart Growth Group, which is uh, the group of developers uh, working throughout our state, but often primarily in the metro area that um, do the majority of the complex sort of institutional scale, more um, larger scale projects. I um, uh, am he, him, preferred pronouns, I'm 41 years old. Um, and I guess just to maybe try and build off of some of the previous comments, which are pretty cool to hear. Uh, I, one thing that sticks on me is the notion of trust. And to answer the question that Sylvia just reminded of us, it, it's sort of, hits me that we need to remember the scale of the economic systems that these administrative rules are uh, aimed at governing. So for example, a $100 million initiative or shift will have basically no impact on our state's trillion dollar housing market or our multi-trillion dollar uh, transportation asset base. And I think this is one of the um, commonly, one of the things I observe where trust is commonly broken because if a process like this yields an outcome that is of little or no actual impact, but it gives the appearance of progress, um, then we make not just no progress, but like anti-progress because everyone's even more distrustful and disappointed. And then all of us are just as guilty as our predecessors. And so um, being mindful of that and not letting that occur is in my mind foremost with respect to the question of how do we achieve a more equitable um, way forward. So um, I'll be happy to try and provide any answers to why does it happen this way? Why do developers do it this way? Um, I've worked in Bend, I've worked in Salem, I've worked in Portland suburbs and I've worked in Portland itself. And it's different answers and for different communities, um, but it's a complex, huge system and uh, I hope to be of help. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Noel. And Bill, I think it's Grop. Correct. Uh, thank you for the time. Uh, again, my name is Bill Grout, go with he, him. Um, at my day job, uh, I'm 40 years plus in the uh, semiconductor chip design industry and high tech communications and bandwidth improvements. I've uh, been doing that since college um, and my in my community leadership, I'm a current school board member of North Marion School District, which is that great big area between Woodburn and Wilsonville along the I-5 corridor. Um, I am the current uh, past president as of two weeks ago of the uh, and founding member, one of the founding members of the Oregon School Board's Color Caucus. Um, we are the basically the largest caucus of BIPOC elected officials in Oregon. And uh, also on the Governor's Council for Education Advancement uh, in Oregon. And uh, previously I was a mayor for six years as well of a small town. 
uh, grew up in public housing outside of Philadelphia on the suburbs of Philadelphia. Wouldn't be here today if we didn't have public housing. Uh, single mom, five kids. I was the youngest uh, getting by day to day. Uh, so that's my uh, background. But I am also a graduate of Portland State. Uh, so I'm proud of my Viking, my Viking education. Uh, my primary interest for being here is uh, really want to look at these rules and help uh, and input on the rules of making sure that we have rules that create a diverse economic and cultural based communities because that is literally what's best for our education systems. Uh, segregated by community school systems never produce optimal results. Uh, they, for everyone, they is important for our kids to understand that uh, racial backgrounds and zip codes should not determine who you will become um, and based on that with your school education background. So really want to do what's um, right for kids in the education system by having uh, rules that definitely strive and push for economic and culturally diverse communities, which includes uh, multimode housing uh, in each area, multimode transportation in each area. Uh, we talk a lot about safe routes to schools, you know, is important for kids, but people have to realize that safe routes to schools is really a family thing. We need parents and families to engage in their education systems. We need them to participate in evening activities, parent-teacher conferences, things like that. They need to access and be able to get to the schools uh, and be part of the education program, as well as the students need to be safely transported back and forth to schools as well. I wanna point out that uh, as well as the education system, of course, these rules have to include uh, access to good food and good healthcare, especially pediatric healthcare, that we provide rules that allow these kind of activities more than just a convenience store and a McDonald's, you know, that uh, healthcare is predominantly driven by uh, access to health, good foods and, and healthy uh, foods and healthcare for, for pediatrics. Um, the effects of planning on the education system work both ways. Uh, we strongly feel that community pride is important in, in having a healthy community. And one of the correlated foundations of community pride is pride in your education system in your, in your community. Uh, we strive for that. Uh, we have metrics for that. And we also want to ensure that, you know, a culturally diverse and accepting community really pushes community pride, which is also then translates to pride in in your school district, and that's important for kids. Um, this is a, um, let me see my notes here. Um, as a high tech guy, you know, I know that we can solve environmental concerns and diversity uh, concerns. This is not a one versus other where, where we get into segregation on what's available to community members and what's not available to community members. There is ways to access equity to all systems, including internet and various other things, which we're all experiencing with distance learning right now due to COVID, uh, but that's also transportation systems as well. There are ways to, uh, to develop rules that allow all to access community needs and for community success. And I'll cut it there, thanks. Thank you, Bill. And uh, Candace? Yes, itikti wigwa kanawishan naika shawash kliu timiks, naika bashnam tich kliu Candice Jimenez. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my Wasco name is Timix and my English name is Candice Jimenez. Um, I come from the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs in Central Oregon, uh, but live here in Portland. Um, and first, I just want to say I'm a community advocate for uh, tribal communities. Um, but in a professional capacity, I am a, a public health research manager and project director at the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board in uh, maternal child health programming. Um, I just want to build on the, the lived experience and uh, communities who are represented here today. Um, and I think what I want to bring is um, amplifying the role of um, intergenerational and intersectional identities. Um, 
really organizing from youth to elders uh, in our communities. And I think this brings forth, um, I think it brings forth the opportunity to achieve uh, climate goals uh, through a, a myriad of ways, really unique, like art, music, storytelling, um, oral histories and uh, community led and mutual aid projects that are really at the, um, I think that are at the forefront of what this means to our peoples, um, you know, wherever we're coming from. And I think centering, um, you know, coming from a public health lens is really centering uh, that community led focus so that we're constantly aware of the, um, the critical issues that our communities are facing like right now. Um, so on the ground, I think this can look like uh, environmental awareness and social justice action in our curriculum um, from you know, the upcoming generations. What does that look like for the youth when we're thinking about from elementary all the way through high school? How are we building this, uh, this lens and perspective from the younger generation so that when they're you know, coming up into these spaces that we were in like this place, um, you know, how much more can they bring um, to represent you know, themselves and their people, but also as a collaborative focus, you know, everybody's coming from um, this place of uh, uh, social justice. And I think a lot of you have brought that up and it really, I think it really highlights the collective expertise of all of our communities. Um, <clears throat> and I think as an indigenous person um, across the Northwest and, and really beyond is that uh, a lot of tribal communities have, um, have really stepped up to formulate and enact their own climate action plans. Um, so I think that we can look to indigenous communities as well, you know, the first peoples of these lands as, um, ways of uh, being responsive and, and honoring the first peoples as well. Um, yeah, so I just want to uh, bring that into, into view and to just think about how um, our humanity is all, you know, it's an all an inter interconnected whole. Um, and that's just something that uh, I think about as a, as a tribal community member. So thank you all. Thank you, Candace. really appreciate that. And next, let's go to Kyle McAdam and then um, Oriana Magnera. So Kyle, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kyle McAdam. I use he, him pronouns, and I work for the Oregon Realtors. Um, started here in March of this year um, and kind of stumbled my way into um, a role in government affairs, uh, primarily focused on increasing public participation in uh, local communities uh, at, among our members, uh, which are about 17,500 uh, licensed um, practicing real estate brokers uh, in the state. Um, I am privileged to be joined on the committee uh, as, with my alternate, uh, Alex Fan. He is a realtor in the Portland area. And uh, something he asked me to share um, uh, during this introductory period uh, that I feel lucky I get to share um, is that the um, Bit about increasing um, public participation and uh, comfort among uh, uh, historically marginalized and uh, disenfranchised communities who have not participated or been able to participate in planning processes uh, and um, similar uh, goings on at local city halls and county commission meetings uh, every week uh, across the state um, is, is a really uh, important aspect of our participation in this and something that we would like to see uh, come out of it as far as measurable outcomes, what it looks like on the ground, I, I think really has to a lot to do with what folks have said is um, uh, non-monetary um, or non-economic uh, indicators of success, uh, such as, you know, increasing uh, rates of attendance, even virtual attendance, as maybe our, our fate for the next while uh, in, in uh, public processes uh, at the local level. It, it shouldn't be this big scary thing to um, call up anybody that represents you uh, at a, uh, in, in the political or governmental space. So um, that's, that's a big, uh, feel really lucky to be among this group of people and working on, on these issues um, as we try and achieve uh, climate goals. Um, and uh, yeah, really uh, just really grateful for, for the opportunity. So thank, thanks again for having me. Thank you, Kyle. 
Um, and before we go to Oriana, I just want to call our next set of folks. So you can be ready to um, introduce yourselves and respond to the question on equity outcomes. So after Oriana, we'll go to Ellen Miller and then Mary Kyle McCurdy and Paige West and Rob Innerfeld. And Oriana, go ahead. Hey all, my name is Oriana Maniera. I use she, her pronouns and I'm the Energy, Climate and Transportation Manager at Verde. Verde is a community-based organization in the Colley neighborhood in Portland. And our mission is to build environmental wealth for communities through uh, organizing, advocacy and social enterprise. Um, and I think to explain a little bit more about what that means, uh, cause that gets at this idea of what we want to achieve in terms of addressing the climate crisis in the way that um, in particular BIPOC communities are disproportionately impacted and other environmental justice communities are disproportionately impacted. Um, listening to kind of what everyone has been saying, I'm reflecting on the difference between achieving climate goals in an equitable way versus a just way. I want to first urge some caution in for folks who are like about to take notes and be like, oh no, I need to say just now and not equitable is I think we have to be really careful about when we use the word just and when we were, use the word equitable. Because uh, I think I am here to fight for uh, climate justice and environmental justice. And I think there are other folks who have already been very clear that that is what they are fighting for versus equity. Um, but there are many people on this Zoom who I think are, are here to achieve more, more equitable goals. And that's not necessarily wrong, but I think we have to be really clear about the difference between the two. And to me, uh, justice means in the way that other folks have expressed, acknowledging historical harms, acknowledging the ways that the system hasn't only had unintended consequences or made communities vulnerable, but it's been specifically designed to do harm, to oppress different communities and to create uh, barriers and divisions and, and hierarchies that reinforce white supremacy. And I think we also in justice have to think about the future and not just the present moment, but how do we be reparative? How do we acknowledge these historical harms, uh, but also do the reparations and the regenerative work that is needed, not only to rebuild trust, but to help make communities whole and to help communities that have been harmed to, to achieve uh, the restoration that is that is needed in many cases. And I think folks have alluded to what that looks like in different regards. To me, I think when we talk about equitable, it means acknowledging historical harms and then maybe stopping doing the harm that we've been doing. But it doesn't always mean that extra kind of reparative step of what would it look like to uh, move resources really meaningfully to address generational wealth gaps that have been created by redlining in our system. What would it mean to really make polluters pay and uh, pay back to community to address the harms to health that are being caused by communities who live near environmental justice harms because of the racist history of planning? Like, I think if we want to talk about justice in that space, then maybe we don't. Uh, certainly I will, and I think certainly others will. It will mean really acknowledging that those disparities exist, but that we don't simply uh, address them by acknowledging that they happen and saying we're sorry and moving on. We really have to be willing to do bold and reparative things that mean reorganizing systems of power and restructuring away from white supremacy, away from ways where we really benefit uh, corporations to do this pollution in communities and really think about how do we redistribute and how do we also not buy into some of the false myths that say that we can't do things that are truly reparative for communities because they'll be harmed because jobs are lost or they'll be harmed in other ways. So I think what I'm hoping to bring into the space is really looking at things from a bold perspective, from a just perspective and not being afraid to, to really speak to kind of some of the truth that is needed in this space and, and needed in this work to acknowledge what, what has happened historically, who has been harmed in that process, why it has happened, what has been upheld and how do we really deconstruct that and not only say, let's rebuild our systems better but make new systems and make sure that those systems are developed and led by, by the communities that we're trying to represent at this table uh, but do so in a way that is, is really truly meaningful and really truly uh, restorative and regenerative and, and reconstructs uh, the, the world that we have created to do harm in a way that is, is truly regenerative. Thank you. Thank you, Ariana. Really appreciate that. Um, and then let's go to Ellen Miller and then Mary Tom McCurdy. I hope I'm still on the right list. Yeah. So Ellen, go ahead. 
Good morning, everyone. I'm Ellen Miller. I prefer pronouns she and her. I am in government affairs at the Oregon Home Builders Association. And I just want to say I'm so impressed with all of the participants today and everything um, that has been brought to our attention and our focus. And um, it's hard to follow all of you, to be quite honest. But as I look at um, the questions that uh, proposed by staff, um, how we do this in an equitable way, I, I feel like we're on the right track. This is actually reminding me of how we started the housing production strategy rack, where we went around the table to talk about uh, what home is to us. And I think that that resulted in a very good outcome um, as far as the rules that were adopted for those housing production strategies. So I think just even witnessing today um, and all of the members here and um, all of the organizations that you represent, I think I think this is the right direction and, and right track. Um, and what it looks like on the ground, you know, I can't answer that question. You know, I think for um, our builders and developers, um, we just want to make sure that um, options remains for housing. Um, we want to make sure that even the most well-intended um, climate policies don't limit options for housing um, that we've been working so hard, for instance, on the House Bill 2001 on the middle housing rules. So we want to make sure that um, when we think of options, we think of um, all groups that need housing um, and that we do it in an equitable way and we don't make assumptions based on our preferences. And I think that is really important. Um, I wanted to comment, Bill mentioned something about zip codes um, determining, being predetermined of uh, success. And, and I think that um, my awareness of opportunity zones that was brought up in um, the House Bill 2001 work as well is uh, very eye-opening. It's made me recognize um, how that can also make a community really livable. Um, those are correlated. And so these are all things that we're thinking of and we hope that um, we can be helpful in this process. So thank you for including us. I appreciate being here. Thank you, Ellen. And Mary Kyle McCurdy. Thank you. My name is uh, Mary Kyle McCurdy. I'm the deputy director and a staff attorney at 1000 Friends of Oregon, and we are a statewide nonprofit land use organization, and my pronouns are she, her. Um, uh, it is hard to follow all of, all of you, um, but in looking at the question of how do we have, how do we ensure just and equitable outcomes, it has to start with the process. Uh, that that's the key first step or we won't reach those um, outcomes. And I am heartened and excited about this rules advisory committee uh, and the work that the department has put out. Um, but I do want to echo something Huey said, which is this same commitment to uh, equity and, and just outcomes has to continue all the way through to the decision-making level and there can't be um, voices that have traditionally had a lot of power having an undue amount of influence at that level uh, because I have seen that in a lot of process, processes before. And to um, echo something Ellen just said about our previous um, housing rules advisory committee that she and I were both just on and as were some others here, we started out that by making a commitment to saying it's not going to be business as usual going forward. Um, it is going to be different. And I think we have to stay with that here too, as um, Oriana was just talking about. And so what does that look like? Um, I think it means taking into account multiple bottom lines of appropriate, affordable, diverse housing uh, in every neighborhood. And I don't think that's a difference between urban and rural or big cities and smaller towns. I really think we need to fight against those use of those terms to divide us and to assume that the um, outcomes needed on the ground are different. They're not. Everyone deserves an affordable, safe house located um, in uh, a walkable neighborhood where walkability is the easier option than using a car for all trips. And I wanna echo something that I think Vivek mentioned earlier about integrating um, what we're doing with health outcomes because our built environment, again, in every size community 
has had a disproportionately adverse impact on lower income communities of colors, those are different abilities, older people in air quality, the ability to walk safely and access things like schools and healthy grocery stores. Um, it's meant a lack of housing options, uh, where zip code does matter to your outcomes, poor transit, and all of those have to be integrated to have um, equitable and just climate outcomes. So um, that's what I'm looking um, towards achieving in this, but starting with an equitable and just process that continues through the decision-making level too. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Kyle, really appreciate that. And all of this is just so great, so much good input on equitable outcomes and kind of want to keep this conversation going forever. <laughs> um, I think we were going to try to plan a break within this section, but I think we'll kind of just try to keep going so that we can get as much of your voices into the conversation as possible. So if you need to get up, move around, turn your video off for a second, please feel free to do that. Um, but we'll just keep going. And I think we're doing pretty well on time, but just a reminder to try to keep your um, introductions to two minutes, if, around two minutes if you can. So let's next go to Paige West and then Rob Innerfeld. You must have given me the reminder to keep it at two minutes because you, you know, all know me pretty well with <laughs> being long-winded. Um, hello, my name is Paige West. I'm the Planning and Strategic Programs Manager at Rogue Valley Transportation District. Um, I serve uh, eight communities in the Medford-Ashland area and uh, have been in this position at RBTD for about 11 years now. And before that, uh, was in transportation demand management or what we now consider as transportation options uh, programs. Um, I'm also on the public transit advisory committee under the um, Oregon DOT and um, also our local metropolitan planning organization, TAC, uh, technical advisory committee. And in that role, um, participated in the strategic assessment that we did here in the RBMPO area and worked uh, many long hours with Cody trying to um, understand the performance metrics and the, the green step model and, and how that could be implemented here in this area. Uh, I'm also on the transportation options group of Oregon board of directors and in that role uh, that that's a, a, a space where we are trying to uh, ensure that uh, all of our politicos and our colleagues around the state realize that simply providing a bike path or a sidewalk or providing a transit line is often not enough to encourage behavior change. And that behavior choices and our transportation choices are often uh, needing an extra encouragement step and a, a, um, a push, if you will, to try transit for the first time or to have um, equitable access to uh, safe um, transportation uh, facilities and knowing how to use them. Um, so, that, that's part of where I'm gonna be coming from. Um, also, I, I helped to develop the STIF uh, bill language in 2015 and 16, and helped to do the implementation with the rulemaking in 2017. And then also in my role here at RBTD have been actually implementing the SIF funds locally and doing the planning work that um, is identifying priorities for transit investments. And I, I, I think I wanna start first by recommending that in our implementation of, of the outcomes of this committee that um, we, we work with our transit providers and we make sure that they are at the table for any of these land use choices that um, are going to be made regarding housing. Uh, because transit, although it can be implemented fairly quickly, the planning is often in years in the making and we need to make sure that there's a, a collaborative process and an inclusionary process uh, with um, uh, the groups that we're hearing from today, which is uh, really refreshing actually to, to be part of this group. And it's one of the first, first groups I've been part of where the equity lens has been put on um, this discussion in, in such a magnificent way. So I, I, I very much appreciate that. And, and as Mary was saying, um, it goes down to the decision-making process because even after some of these decisions are made at the state level. They do have to be implemented at the local level. And I, I wanna see flexibility at the local level, both with transit providers and with cities and counties and how they're allowed to um, continue this work and, and make sure that we're meeting the marks, but also um, make it a, a place-making uh, exercise for them and, and really include uh, people of color and 
um, and have that equity lens all the way down the line because that that is something that's missing um, down at the the city, county, state level still. So I'm I'm glad that we're we're seeing this. Um, personally, I I was uh, car free for five years, four of those years in Eugene, and when I attended University of Oregon, and then one year here in Medford, and quickly realized that being car free in Medford was not at all realistic compared to uh, when I lived in Eugene, and so I ended up having to purchase a car. Um, and uh, I think you know we need to realize that owning a car is a privilege and that um, there are many people who cannot afford to own a car or who uh, do not have access to a car because of their age uh, or their um, physical abilities. So equity to me um, on the ground level is recognizing that although this is a, a, a effort to reduce greenhouse gases um, with driving, that to me means that anyone who's currently not driving can kind of be pushed aside. And I, I think that's a very scary uh, realm for us to be um, discussing uh, our choices because uh, we have youth who cannot drive, we have older adults who cannot drive, we have people with disabilities who cannot drive, and then we have a vast amount of people who simply can't afford to own a vehicle or choose to drive as often as they would like. And so um, the choices that we make and the recommendations that we make in this space, I wanna make sure that we are including and providing benefit to the non-driving public as well. Um, I, I also um, really appreciate the, the talk about quality housing and um, wanna make sure that we are, are encouraging um, uh, quality housing and comfortable housing in walkable communities that are accessible to transit. But you know, really, to me, it comes down to dignity and giving people that um, that ability to have dignity within their day to day lives and know that they have access to transportation that they want to use, um, not just because they can afford it, but because it's something that we are um, really obligated to start providing to all all people, um, whether regardless of race or income. Um, and, and then also, um, you know, making sure that we are, um, you know, not, not just relying on uh, building facilities, bike lanes and sidewalks and, and putting in more transit, um, but, but realizing that there are um, a, a number of people who don't know how to ride a bike, as strange as that might be um, to you, but there are people who don't know how to ride a bike. Um, there are um, older adults who take four to five minutes to cross a, a, an intersection because of their, their physical ability. Um, and there are people who are scared to use transit. They've never used it before. They don't know how to use it. And so um, we really, we just can't assume that because we're providing the built environment for people that they're going to all of a sudden start using it. Because um, the, the reality is that um, in my experience, it it just doesn't happen that way. There are early adopters, but then there's not. So um, appreciate being part of this uh, effort again. I was part of the RAC in 2018, and there was a lot of good, um, a lot of good solutions that came out of that uh, that didn't actually get adopted. But uh, the the task now is much more uh, on our plates <laughs> that I'm seeing, um, and I'm I'm excited. I'm excited to see what we're able to accomplish. So thank you. Thank you, Paige, really appreciate that. And just the acronym check for the STIF that Paige mentioned, that's the State Transportation Improvement Fund for Transit in case folks were um, curious. And next we're gonna go to Rob Innerfeld and I'll just call our next group of folks that we'll be calling on, which are um, Emma Newman and then Kari Schlossauer, Nancy Evanson and Paul Belota. And Rob, go ahead. Hi, I'm Rob Innerfeld. I'm, I serve as transportation planning manager for the city of Eugene, and my pronouns are he and him. And I did actually serve on the previous RAC a few years ago. Um, and I, honestly, it was frustrating when it's sort of the 11th hour that the recommendations from that RAC were pulled. But um, one thing I remember is that I don't recall any discussion of equity at all in, in, in the rulemaking that we talked about then. So I appreciate that there's sort of been a restart on that and an opportunity to uh, to really look more deeply at, at all these issues that people are bringing up. And I really appreciate a, a lot of the comments that I've heard. Um, 
I, I want to acknowledge that it's really hard to change people's travel behavior. I think that's something we need to really acknowledge going into this process, especially in, when you think about how our state is mostly built out in single family neighborhoods. And even though we have a lot of growth ahead of us, still we, we have the basis of our communities already built. And um, we also have a huge task ahead of us to reduce greenhouse gases from transportation in communities like Eugene, where driving and owning a car is relatively inexpensive compared to places that have a much higher non-driving mode share. Because ultimately we're talking about a lot less driving. So in terms of more tangible outcomes around equity, here's some thoughts that most people have access to affordable, healthy food, childcare, and other needed services without needing to own a car that all or most neighborhoods and metro areas provide people with safe and comfortable walking and biking infrastructure. And that whether or not you own a car is not a determinant of how much time you spend traveling to work and other key destinations. And that pollution from transportation does not disproportionately impact frontline communities. In terms of housing, that we have complete neighborhoods with a mix of services, or I'm sorry, that complete neighborhoods with a mix of services have ample affordable housing. People earlier mentioned how we often get gentrification in the, in the more complete communities that we have, and we need to look at ways to avoid that. And then also that people don't need to leave metro areas in order to access housing affordable to them. A lot of what's happening in, in our metro area is that people who want affordable single family in particular are leaving the Eugene Springfield area to go to outlying communities that they have to, and then they end up driving a lot more and I think I'm sure that's happening in other parts of the state as well. In terms of how do we measure our progress, one thing we've done in our MPO area is we've we, first the city of Eugene commissioned it and several about six years ago, and then um, the MPO did. Um, could, we hired the, the survey from a DHM to com, to conduct a survey of around 500 people in our metro area and ask them how do they get around. And so we're getting a much richer data set of. Um, the different ways that people travel around our communities and how they make their decisions. I don't think we have measures of equity and racial justice into that, but I think that's something that we can add. And um, ultimately, I think we need to do our own surveys on transportation and, and how people get around and not just rely on the, on the census data, which is not a rich data set. Um, one outcome I'd like to see is a change in how we do community, community engagement for transportation. Too much of the time we ask people to respond to the projects that we've already developed, whether those are highway widenings or bike paths. And we really need to get, um, get to people earlier in the process and ask them, what are, the, what are the challenges you face in getting around our communities? And, and to, to help people in frontline communities have a more um, elemental role in, de in determining what kind of capital projects we build. Um, I serve on a couple of different ODOT uh, committees, one on the public, the public transportation committee that Paige referenced, and also the Safe Routes to School Advisory Committee. And all the ODOT grant programs for active transportation, they're hugely oversubscribed, which shows that there's a, just a huge need in our communities for investments in walking and biking and transit infrastructure. And I completely agree with Paige that we need the transportation options side, but we also need much more complete infrastructure if we're going to have any chance at all of reaching our goals. So, you know, ultimately we really, I appreciate that there's some ODOT staff on this meeting. And I think ultimately the Oregon Transportation Commission is gonna be, they're gonna to need to be much more engaged in these kinds of conversations. Right now they're talking about how to pro program transportation funding for 24 through 27. And just for the first time, even though this, even though this statewide transportation um, strategy was completed in 2013. This is the first time they're actually talking about integrating um, climate goals into decision making around transportation funding. And, and the first year that this is impacting is 24. So it's taken 11 years from when their plan was completed for climate and transportation to actually start integrating that into decision making, which I just think that's awful as a state that it's taken us this long. And obviously, better late than never, but we all know what a what a terrible situation we're in and with our just meeting our goals. And so, um, and they're in a really tough spot. They're in, there's a huge short, shortfall in funding just for basic maintenance of the transportation system. Um, and so I really encourage people to get engaged in that process. And I encourage the um, LCDC to work closely with the Oregon Transportation Commission on this because we're, as much as we do with the, with the rulemaking on this side, 
the 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 role that the OTC plays is so important, and we I just want to make sure that we don't forget that. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Really appreciate that. Uh, next, let's go to Emma Newman and then uh, Kari. Emma, go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, Emma Newman, she, her, AA pronouns. I am the senior transportation planner with the city of Springfield. I collaborate with Rob Innerfeld a lot since we share our urban area and Springfield Eugene metro area. Um, growing up, I was involved a lot in climate activism. That then led to me actually studying environmental studies at University of Oregon. And more throughout my, um, throughout my work there, I started researching and focusing in on multimodal transportation. Uh, after that, I was involved in Safe Routes to School. I was the sustainability coordinator at University of Oregon working with student groups. And then that led to my current position at the city of Springfield um, doing transportation planning. I am very familiar with working with limited resources and that retrofitting existing cities, similar to what Rob was saying, is very challenging. Um, I think the equitable equitable outcomes that I would like to see is really focusing on investments that meet the needs of people who face the most transportation barriers. And there is that nexus between how we get around and the distance to the places we want to get to. Um, destinations are not separate from transportation and vice versa. I think we need to be looking at, you know, building out robust walking, biking, and transit infrastructure, but making sure that those investments aren't just happening in the communities that have the means to pay for the larger investments. Um, instead, I'd like to see the investments happening where they're most needed um, and would fulfill the needs that are not being met due to the historical lack of investments or investments in uh, systems that specifically did not work for communities um, who were not in power. And just to echo Alma, Julie, and a number of other comments about the, you know, cookie cutter approach is not going to work. It's really important to provide flexibility to honor and celebrate the differences between the different communities in our state. I mean, uh, Rob speaking to Eugene, Eugene's different from Springfield. Our metro area is different from Portland metro, is different than Rogue Valley and Bend. Um, and then I just wanted to say I really appreciated Amy's contributions at the beginning of this uh, meeting and I look forward to the rest of the process. Thank you, Emma. Really appreciate that. And um, Kari, go ahead. Thanks, Sylvia. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, such a great group of folks. I'm really excited to see so many people that um, I consider friends and that I've worked a lot with and a lot of um, new voices that I'm looking forward to to getting to know um, you all. My name is Kari Schlosshauer and I use she, her pronouns, although they is fine and as is my name. Um, and you can call me Carrie if you really want to, but my name is Kari. Um, and Sylvia got that right, but um, I know that a lot of folks see my name and, and um, like to, to say it as Carrie. So I, I respond to anything. Um, so I just wanted to share a little bit about myself. I've lived in the Northwest, the Pacific Northwest for 25 years and um, in honestly every one of those years I've seen and lived and worked um, to address displacement. I've seen affordability pressures on housing and transportation. And um, I've known that entire time, um, I think we've probably all known and recognized now that especially in the Northwest, uh, transportation continues to be the largest contributor to climate emissions. And that has definitely shaped my personal and professional life. Um, I have worked in transportation uh, for about 20 years. I now have two kids that are not yet teenagers and that is um, definitely an important lens for me that our future and all of our future is a big important lens um, to, to consider. For the past seven years, I've been a policy manager for the Safe Routes Partnership, um, which is a national nonprofit. And my work has been primarily focused in the greater Portland area, um, although I do work with a lot of partners all across Oregon and Southwest Washington. Um, and my work really centers community partners to build healthy and thriving communities that work for all ages and abilities and um, just really appreciate a lot of the comments that have already been made about um, incorporating uh, just a variety of different needs and perspectives um, in our communities and in our transportation system, especially. Um, and 
this, you know, this really includes um, those who have worked with me will know well that my work is not limited to just schools as destinations, but um, that this really incorporates a lot of the work that we're going to be focusing on in this rack. Um, affordable housing that is near transportation, affordable, accessible, healthy, and clean, all of those things, transportation that, uh, you know, really allows everyone to be able to get everywhere they need to go and then back home safely. So that's um, a lot of the focus that I bring to this work. Um, and just wanted to, to state, you know, my work uh, has, has and continues to really prioritize those who can't, don't, or won't rely on private vehicles. And others have said this as well, but um, I think that's a really important part of this committee's charge that um, the, the goals and, and where we end up um, has to be able to also incorporate the needs of those who are unable to, for whatever reason, um, use a vehicle. Uh, and so that's a, an important element. Um, you know, there's been so many great statements that have been uh, uh, put forward already, and I won't rehash them all, but um, in terms of how we do this in an equitable uh, way, you know, I think that it's really essential that we keep in mind the importance of incorporating the needs of voices that haven't traditionally been heard, um, the needs of frontline communities, prioritizing those needs, and I think especially that that is um, quite often likely to not be the majority, and it may fly in the face of what the majority is or says that they want or need. And I think that's um, you know, uh, something that we're going to need to do a lot of work to, to balance um, in, in this committee. Um, I think that thinking about, a lot of people have talked about this sort of cookie cutter approach. I greatly appreciate the need for flexibility and that there are a lot of different communities um, across the state, a lot of different needs, but as others have said, um, a lot of our needs are also the same. And I also want to make sure that we're not using um, perceived or real differences to put forward as an excuse that would replicate planning that continues to confirm the status quo um, by only taking small steps toward the goals that we know we need to take um, around climate mitigation and or um, would likely cause further disparities uh, to communities that are, are most harmed by climate pollution. So, um, that's really a lot of the perspective and um, what I'm sort of thinking about with this committee. I'm really excited to be here. I also wanted to say that I do have an alternate, um, Sushmita Padar, who's a planning commissioner in Washington County, and um, she will be, she's on the call and she will be my alternate and we'll be in close communication um, as we move forward. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kari. Thanks so much. And we knew it was going to be really hard to have this rich discussion with this group of people with such varied um, and and important lived experiences. And we're moving a little uh, we're moving a little further, in, or we're moving past the time that we intended to end this agenda topic. But we want to keep going. We still have about eight members, primary RAC members, that we'd like to introduce themselves and respond to the question on equity outcomes. So we're going to try to do that. But we ask that you try to keep your comments brief. And again, we do have the post-meeting survey where you can provide more thoughts um, in writing to the RAC and, and those thoughts will go to the entire RAC as well as to DLCD staff. All right, so next let's go to Nancy Evanson and then Paul Belota. Hello, I should be, I should be on, not? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, okay. So I'm, I'm Nancy Evanson. I'm a retired architect. Moved to uh, Oregon because my lungs have been compromised by some very nice uh, uh, environmental pollution. I am working with the Sustainability Committee on some retrofit clinics because I feel like a lot of things are easy to do at the state, local, or even city level, but uh, when you when you think about the number of homes that we have and the amount of uh, pollution that they provide, uh, that's that's a problem where you have to convince people one by one. But it's also very important for. Um, for disadvantaged pe people and populations 
uh, because their housing tends to drop to the bottom of that, to, to housing that is, uh, it's very leaky in terms of, of cold and warm, that's housing that is very inefficient and the, the economic costs of that to, to those populations are very high. And so I'm not sure how all of that connects to transportation, but hopefully somebody's going to tell me in this and I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Nancy. And next we'll have Paul. And before Paul Belota um, speaks, just calling on the next group of speakers, we'll call on um, Arielle Nelson and then Caitlin Labont. Ken, uh, no, we already talked to Ken Anderton, um, Margie Bradway and Ron Irish. And Paul, go ahead. Sure. My name is Paul Bellotta. Uh, for the last four and a half years, I've been the Community Development Director for the City of Corvallis. Um, originally came from Eugene, but then uh, moved away for three decades. So I've got some experience from other places, uh, I think, that can come back in here as well. Um, first time being involved in a state committee like this, have done it in other states. Uh, so interested in seeing uh, the difference here. Um, Kind of my primary benefit, I think, for being on this group is I'm old and therefore have uh, done a lot of things and uh, had worn different hats, some of the things that I've done. Um, not only have I worked on the public side, I was a private developer, uh, including working for an African-American owned company that only worked in uh, areas where that had been previously redlined uh, to bring investment into those areas. Um, as a consultant, I was a, a transit oriented design expert uh, throughout uh, the US and Canada uh, was responsible for some of the uh, TOD guidelines, uh, particularly in the Minneapolis St. Paul area, and also spent a lot of time on brownfields uh, where we deal with a lot of the equity issues around that uh, in areas where you have, uh, you know, former uh, paper mills, former auto uh, areas that are, are pretty difficult to deal with and, and those issues. Um, in Corvallis here, we, we're dealing with the same sorts of things that everybody else is. I think we are one of the areas that has in the past prided itself on some of the uh, things we do on transit and uh, bike ped. Uh, but then again, we are also the number one least affordable city in the state. So uh, we're seeing that tension on a daily day to day basis as well. Uh, so just looking forward to being involved with this great group of people and offering whatever I can to help. Thank you, Paul. And next, let's go to Ariel Nelson. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Ariel Nelson um, with the League of Oregon Cities. Um, I'm part of the Intergovernmental Relations Lobby team focused on housing and land use. Um, I'm really excited to be here uh, with so many great brains and experts um, and community voices around the table. Um, and really see my role on uh, this rack as supporting um, the many local government voices and the cities that you see on the rack, as well as those that aren't at the table. Um, I really appreciate um, some of the point, well, so many of the points that have been raised so far. I um, appreciate Amy at the beginning calling out this historic lack of trust from government planners um, and really appreciate the recognition from DLCD and LCDC to really be grounding their work in equity and racial justice and had um, the benefit of participating in the recent RAC process for the middle housing and housing production strategies um, bills. And just want to, um, you know, remind folks that um, cities and local governments are your um, implementation partners for this state work. And so I want to make sure that the important work that happens at the state level can connect to the local systems, the local communities and the local voices as well. Um, and that includes our recognition um, and the ability to build in some flexibilities to recognize the differences in communities um, as well as what resources are gonna be needed. Um, we know that transit does not look the same around the state um, and that it is, you know, it's not a reality in, in many parts, many cities for fa working families to rely on transit and to forego a car, or um, especially when there's multiple people working in a household. So what kind of resources are going to need to be brought to bear to support the progress and the change that we want to see throughout the state, um, making sure we can um, point where, the, where, the, where we need those investments, um, but really look forward to this process um, and ensuring that 
um, those conversations are informed from all corners of the rack and everyone involved. So thanks for having me. Thank you. And let's go to Caitlin and then I, Brad Clark has to leave a little early. So let's bring him into the queue. So Caitlin and then Brad. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Caitlin Labonte. I'm here representing the Oregon chapter of the American Planning Association. Where I serve on the diversity, equity, inclusion group, the legislative and policy affairs group and the climate group. Um, so I'm bringing that perspective with me today. I also work as a land use planner at Dowell and I have a 13 month old daughter and um, becoming a mom has really amplified my sense of urgency um, to address climate change. Um, there's been too many brilliant ideas here um, said today that um, for me to really uh, point out the stuff that I agree with. So I'll just thank everyone for their perspectives. There's been a lot of good stuff um, said today and I'll add um, a couple ideas. So big picture, you know, thinking about where we want to be in 10 or 20 years. We want um, housing variety and housing choice in um, you know, employment areas and access to transit. So people of all income levels are um, able to access energy efficient homes with different amenities and um, short commute times. Um, and moving forward, I think um, really leading with the perspective that um, the people closest to the problems are often best poised to develop those solutions. So um, seeing our role as really kind of building into the rules and procedures, how we um, uh, prioritize community um, needs and preferences in uh, urban design, building design, and um, also how we make investment decisions. So, um, you know, we're not requiring bike lanes to get built somewhere where, um, you know, the community's been asking just for safe intersections and sidewalks for 10 years. So um, really building into um, creating some institutional capacity so that these kind of prioritizations aren't dependent on the goodwill of individual staff members, but it's kind of built into and codified into how we operate and implement this um, this work. And then also um, other folks have touched on this, but um, you know, mitigating and preventing displacement and also developing metrics that adequately um, measure different elements of equity. And so we're not just looking at um, reducing greenhouse gases, but we're um, developing metrics that um, appropriately address um, community needs and preferences um, as we do this um, climate work. Um, my alternate is Jonathan Harker, who was a planner for city aggression for 30 years and has a lot of knowledge for the you know, history of uh, climate work in the state and we'll be setting these ideas with um, you know, the, the committees that I'm on as well. So uh, they bring a wealth of uh, um, experience and information as well. So thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. And Brad Clark. I'm not hearing Brad if you're on the line. All right, let's let's unmute. get back to you, Brad. Brad, are you able to unmute? All right. Well, let's keep going, and we'll go back to Brad. Um, Margie or Margie at Metro. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Margie Broadway with the hard G. I'm the deputy director of the Metro Planning and Development Department. In my role as deputy director, I oversee the MPO functions of Metro. Um, and I think most of you are aware in the Portland Metro region, Metro also has um, an increasing role in housing and economic development. Um, I will, as part of a committee member, do my best to represent the 24 local implementing agencies that we work with, as well as the input from Metro Council and my colleagues at Metro. Um, on a personal level, I'm also a recovering attorney. I think there's several of us here. I have a long um, history and bureaucracy working in state and local and now regional government. Um, quickly, I just want to say that and, and second, many people who say the first step is really acknowledging the racist past of urban planning to move forward on equity. I believe Alma, Amy, Mari, Oriana all gave really good examples of the racist past of 
transportation planning, housing planning, and, and, and land use. And the first is to acknowledge that. Um, second, I want to just also acknowledge Huey's comments on kind of community engagement as it relates to power and power structures, MPOs and, and Metro, and all of us are part, or at least I am and my agency part of those dynamics. And it's really gonna take a lot of work to not just do community engagement, but to do community empowerment. Um, I think Laquita also talked about that. And then lastly, there were several really good on the ground strategies um, that relate everything from a just transition on technology. That was something I think Amy mentioned, as well as help, uh, which Mary Kyle and Vivek, Vivek, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name, talked about. Um, but I think that could all, all, all the strategies that are kind of on the ground, I think can be somewhat summed up by really analyzing and aligning investments, um, which is something Shane mentioned. How do we not only do the policy work we need to do in this space, but also align the investments to match that policy as it relates to uh, equity and social justice. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Margie. And Ron Irish. Good morning, I'm Ron Irish. I'm the Transportation Systems Analyst with the City of Albany. Uh, I've been there 27 years, so, so too long. Uh, during that time, I've, I've been involved in both the engineering side, uh, development of TSPs, as well as the planning side, so actual development review, as well as some long range planning. In terms of comments, I think, I, I don't know that I could do any better than just echo what Rob Interfeld said. Uh, I, I think he touched on most everything I'd hit. Uh, a lot of the projects from, from the transportation point of view, they, they have tended to be, well, they've taken climate into effect, not really as much equity to this point. And so I'm, I'm pleased to see the diversity of this group because I think that's gonna help us try to fit that into the puzzle in terms of project selection, how projects are developed and, and, and designed. Uh, in terms of project development and delivery at the end, you know, in, in a TSP for a local agency like Albany, there's a lot of projects uh, in a limited amount of money. So our, our council and community is picking capacity projects versus transit versus bike ped. Uh, and it's pretty much a local decision without a lot of guidelines. Uh, and so maybe out of this process would come some way to incentivize projects that had the, the climate component as well as the equity component, because there's, there's not really anything that along those lines, it's not just a local decision now. And depending on the community you're in, some, some communities would, would uh, give those projects priority and some wouldn't. Uh, and so I, I'll stop there. I'm short of time. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Really appreciate that. And in a second, we'll check again if Bradley Clark is on the line. And then I think we only have two other RAC members, which are Alex with the City of Medford and Jana Jarvis with the Oregon Trucking Association. Um, if you think you're a primary RAC member, but you haven't been called on, just let me know through the chat or we'll do another check after, after these three that go. Um, so Brad Clark, are you on the line? All right, still not able to hear from Brad. So um, Brad, feel free to type your comments into the chat if you're able to, we'll check with you after the meeting. Um, and Alex? I'm Alex Georgievich with the City of Medford. I'm the Deputy Public Works Director and City Engineer. Um, been doing that for five years and uh, previously for 15 years, I was the Transportation Manager there. Um, I've worked in both private and public. Ironically, I told myself I'd only worked for five years in the public sector and over 20 years later, I'm still here. So um, I hope that there's a lot of good work still um, to be done. I am the person apparently on this committee that's gonna be incredibly intimidated, both by the questions being asked and by the people involved. Um, it is a very diverse group and I appreciate all the different um, comments made. I will say that one of my biggest concerns as I'm thinking of how, um, this will be achieved on the ground. Um, this is something I've been thinking about through reading all of the information provided and, and over the last couple of weeks. And I'm really struggling with how we're gonna make it 
an affordable venture for everyone. Um, saying that, I've, I've seen many mixed use developments turn into exclusive communities, not, um, not inclusive of everyone. And I'm really struggling with when those investments are made, how we're gonna include everyone so that we can have transportation systems that serve everyone. Um, I'm also a parent of two adult children. Uh, and so I worry about their future and obviously climate is a big part of that. And I'm really curious to see how this goes. I will cut it short and look forward to continuing to learn as we go. Thank you, Alex. And um, Jana? Thank you. So you saved me for last. I'm Jana Jarvis. I am the president and CEO of the Oregon Trucking Association. I spent about a decade with the realtors. So I worked with LCDC a lot at the time. Um, I remember the conversations around, you know, creating communities where you could live where you worked, which was always confusing to me at the time because my husband worked in Vancouver and I worked in Salem and it made it a little harder to figure out where that would be. And I think as we look at the mobility in the workforce, those issues continue, but every now and then you have a disruptor event like we've just had with COVID. And the fact now that so many people are working from home and that's likely to change what work looks like going forward, we need to take some of that into consideration you know, in this conversation. But during this period of time, I think it's been more important than ever that we've had good road network and access so that we could, um, in the trucking industry, we could get you all the products that you have been uh, needing, you know, for those of you, there are a lot of people that aren't even going to the grocery store that are ordering and having things delivered to their home. And that's all dependent on having a road network that facilitates that. And so I represent a group of folks who have had their lives turned upside down with COVID over the last eight or nine months because it's made a huge impact on our industry. And I think that will should be part of our conversation going forward when we're talking about equity. I hope we're talking about equity of opportunity. And so I'll bring some of that perspective to the table. So thank you. Thanks so much, Jana. And thank you to all of you for all of this discussion. Um, does anyone feel like we've missed someone? Well, thank you everyone. And really um, for sharing just your, your experience from your lived experience and for your vulnerability and sharing your stories and your perspectives and sharing your expertise. This has been really valuable. And um, it, Samantha, do you wanna go ahead and share the screen? We did try to, we had some staff that were trying to capture your ideas and succinct ideas and themes to put together just what, what are the equitable outcomes that this group is looking for as we move forward. And we're just gonna flash this up for, for the sake of time and may bring it back at the next meeting. But these are just some of the key words that you've all been bringing up. And I think this is just a, um, a reflection of this rich conversation, but of course, hard to put an hour and a half long conversation into one graphic here. So thank you all for, for your time. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it back over to DLCD staff to um, go into our next section, which is a review of climate and pollution re uh, reduction efforts to date and just how this process fits into everything else that's going on in the state. So over to Cody and Bill, I believe. Great. Thanks, everyone. That was a really great discussion, and I really appreciated learning uh, so much from you all. Um, I guess this is kind of our uh, turn to kind of share back a little bit, and I'm going to try to do this really briefly because I think we got to start wrapping up pretty soon. Um, so just as an overview, um, you know, over the last year, we've been working on scoping to get to this day. Um, it started in September of 2019, uh, DLCD, DEQ, our Department of uh, Land Conservation Development, Department of Environmental Quality, Department of Energy and uh, Department of Transportation received a letter from the governor uh, directing the four agencies to really take uh, climate and reducing our carbon pollution as a top priority. Um, and over this last year, our agency directors and leadership uh, chair of the commissions have been meeting with staff to um, respond to that. Um, and then in March, we uh, kind of got that codified into um, a specific directive in the executive order 2004 on the screen here. 
Um, there's three main areas of focus that I think that we kind of are looking at in this effort. Uh, Section three is just that the EO says, um, you know, agencies really have to prioritize reducing uh, climate pollution um, and in a cost-effective manner. We also need to do that um, while recognizing, um, you know, some of the actions um, that impact vulnerable populations and then consult with the Environmental Justice Task Force. Um, section nine is um, directed towards, you're gonna hear this a lot, the statewide transportation strategy. Uh, that's what the four agencies have been uh, implementing a work plan to kind of get that back on track. That's the overall roadmap to reduce carbon emissions in the state, just from the transportation sector. Um, so the four agencies have completed that work plan. It's a rolling two-year work plan, um, and that's called the Evermile Counts campaign. Um, and then section 10, this says areas of focus for DLCD. This is really an ODOT section, um, but... Um, looking at a process for, as Rob Innerfeld um, really gave a good synopsis here um, of, you know, hey, we invest a lot of money in the state, and that's through the statewide transportation improvement program. It's like a giant project list um, that we really need to start evaluating the emissions that come from those projects. Uh, then, of course, we need to put an equity lens on everything that we're doing here. Uh, next slide, please. So the Every Mile Counts campaign, um, you can find more information on the ODOT website. Um, it's really, it's multi-agency. It's these four agencies you see below. Um, and when we talk about reducing greenhouse gas emissions from transportation sector, uh, we think of it as a three-legged stool. There's three ways to do it. You can reduce driving, how much total miles, sorry about that, someone's reading the doorbell. Um, how much total uh, VMT, vehicle miles traveled or driving that people do, the types of fuels that go in and are burnt, low carbon fuels, and then actually cleaning up, you know, uh, the emissions by having zero emission vehicles like electric cars. Um, and we put together this work plan and we uh, recognized these four effort areas that we wanted to focus on that we felt were collaborative and that really had most kind of um, bang for our buck in the near term. Um, so next slide, please. In your report, we have um, pages 15 through 39, a lot of resource material. I'm trying to sum up kind of like 14 years worth of work here. Um, and I'm just gonna hit the high notes for you. Um, I did wanna point out that, you know, the state has an overall reduction goal that is for the, the giant's pie of carbon emissions. That includes things like agricultural practices, household driving, um, you know, any, any number of sources of emissions. Um, and so that was adopted in 2007. Um, in 2009, 2010, there was some key legislation that really just narrowed down on the transportation uh, slice. And that's about 39% of our emissions. Um, and so that created a requirements for our metropolitan areas to reduce um, greenhouse gases through just the you know, transportation that households do. I created our scenario planning program, which we'll be talking a lot about. Um, it created the requirement for ODOT to um, create the statewide transportation strategy. Um, and so our commission, LCDC, adopted these targets for metropolitan areas to reduce greenhouse gases in 2011. Uh, in 2013, ODOT um, developed and accepted the uh, STS. Then, um, you know, we've done a lot of work through the scenario planning program. Uh, Metro has a mandatory process. They've been really doing great work up there. Um, Central Lane has done one, and then we have what we call a strategic assessment, which is a voluntary process. Um, and I would just say that Kevin at the outset said it's computer modeling, but that's one component. We can quantify things like household transportation costs, greenhouse gas emissions, you know, health outcomes using computer models, but it's really a community conversation. And it really recognizes that carbon emissions and you know, the transportation network and the housing markets don't respect uh, city limits, right? And so cities can work together in a region to come up with, um, you know, agreements of how do we want to look forward and get to the future that we want and then find out ways to get to that future. Um, so that's really the benefit of pursuing that work. Um, we did hear about in 2018, the rulemaking advisory committee members. So I just want to um, kind of, you know, talk a little bit about that. Uh, in 2017, we did some technical amendments to our targets, and then 
that spun off into a second advisory committee in 2018 for our transportation planning rules. And so that rulemaking was paused by our agency leadership. So those rules were not adopted. Um, there was some really great work that went into those rules. We had a lot of process um, recommendations. We came up with some performance measures that kind of got at greenhouse gas emissions reductions through transportation planning. Um, so that work is there, but we really are respecting that we're starting a fresh page today. You know, we might bring back some of the ideas that came from that work, but um, just wanted to make sure that folks know that we're here to listen to you and um, this is kind of a new day um, and we're not starting, I don't think, from the place of let's just adopt those rules and the things that came from that process. Um, this is a, a much more inclusive group. Um, we have very specific directives from the governor and our agency leadership. Um, so I just want to, you know, have a ton I can talk about and I just want people to know that look me up on the web, DLCD. Um, I'm open to phone calls, uh, emails, if I can help, you know, clarify any questions. I, some of the stuff can be pretty weighty material. Um, so I'm more than happy to help, you know, talk with anyone to, you know, get you the information you need. So I think we're gonna have maybe some questions, right? Sylvia, we weren't hearing you. Oh, sorry about that. Thank you. I was double muted. Um, yeah, so cute questions. Anyone have any clarifying questions that would be helpful for the group to hear responses to? Cody did that presentation in record speed probably. Um, any questions, go ahead and raise your hand or just speak up if you're not able to do that. Um, Bill? Sorry, going through the logistics of clicking. Um, I was wondering how much data is available, not from the standard, but disaggregated data by race and by cultural backgrounds that you guys collect at DLCD. Uh, we do a lot of disaggregated data at Oregon Department of Education, but I don't know about DLCD. I think that we primarily rely on census data and the American Community Survey data at the disaggregate level, uh, which goes down kind of um, to block group or tract level. So kind of disaggregate underneath the city limits. Um, but I don't think that we collect our own data on that, um, those topics. Is that possible to, to do that? Cody, if I may, and um... Bill, if I could just chime in here, this is Kirsten Green, and sorry, my main Zoom, main computer threw me off there, um, so I'm not on camera, but the, um, Cody, maybe you could just talk a little bit about the technical support team that's sort of an undergirding for this work that we'll be getting in specifically to the question of data. This is, Bill, you're hitting on a really big and important topic, and we're a bit obsessed about it right now. We know our data is insufficient, so we're also would like to be thinking about with this group, you know, what 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 we think about, you know, what we look at as sort of examples through this process, because we know our data is inadequate. So what do we look at as examples through this process? Maybe there's a sample community that would like to volunteer to kind of, you know, help illuminate our thinking in this regard, but then also what we ask of communities to be looking at as they develop their response to the rules. Um, so there's kind of two levels. Um, but there's great interest in this all the way up and down kind of the vertical levels of government. Um, so Cody, could you describe the technical support team and Bill, we'd certainly love to collaborate with you on what data um, the School Board Association uh, collects, but Cody? Sure, yeah, thanks for the reminder there, Kirsten. Um, so we are working with what we're calling the technical support green team to support uh, this rulemaking. Um, and that is our Every Mile Counts partners um, with, uh, Oregon Housing Community Services um, and Oregon Health Authority. Um, and so those are kind of like the agency leadership um, kind of tabling uh, some of the ideas we'll be talking about here and we'll bring some of that information um, that they bring to you. But I think in a lot of ways that we're um, kind of looking forward to the horizon to help implement what we can come up with here in the future. And so that we're kind of keeping them up to speed with, you know, what we're gonna come out with this isn't just a set of rules, it's implementation. And we're gonna to have to stand it up and make sure that 
uh, you know, I heard a lot about the decisions being made, you know, and putting into motion there. So um, one of the aspects that we're looking at is, um, you know, equity outcomes and how do we prioritize work or look for the burden um, of decision making. And so that demographic data is really key to drive those decisions. Um, if, you know, you're just building things blindly and you don't know where they're occurring or what groups um, of neighborhoods that they're occurring in, then you're kind of uh, steering a little bit blind there. And so I think that uh, demographic data is going to be really important. Um, I will say that I am predisposed to making it very um, less intensive for our cities and I want them to be able to do this easily. So I think I always kind of rely on census data, but I don't know what I don't know at this point. So I'm definitely interested in hearing more ideas about like what are good sources of data that we can get at a uniform kind of statewide level. I just add, I'll take you up on that collaboration opportunity between the data we have in education versus, you know, to augment what data you have. Okay. Thanks for the offer. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Bill and Cody. I just want to give a shout out to Business Oregon and the governor's office who are also participating in the technical support team. Thanks right. again. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. And Noel Johnson. Uh, yeah, I was just going to contribute to that question, which is to suggest that we take a look at the Opportunity Insights work done. Um, this is probably the preeminent across the nation. Uh, study it's out of harvard and brown where places and spaces and their impact longitudinally on um, issues of equity and justice are sort of understood and analyzed it's a phenomenal big data effort and it really helps understand which of the levers we might pull have a comparatively larger or uh, less so impact and so um, i think the issues that our communities in Oregon are facing are relatively uh, widespread, sadly, and the Opportunity Insights Group is um, some of the best data down to the census block track uh, that we have for every census block track in the entire nation. So I'd point DLCD and um, everyone else in that direction as to readily available and awesome data. And then I've found separately the staff there, and it's well staffed, very receptive to um, outreach and to sort of digging in and helping out answer specific questions with big data. Thank you. Great, thanks, Noel. Thank you, Noel. Okay, great. Well, if there aren't any other questions, let's move into our next steps and wrap up here. And again, if you do have other questions, feel free to email the DLCD team and maybe Kateri can put that email into the chat again. If you have other questions that you feel didn't, you didn't get a chance to um, get answered today. So I'll hand it over to Kevin Young um, at DLCD to wrap us up with some next steps and then over to Commissioner Lelac to close us out. Actually, I think maybe Bill was gonna cover this piece. There's not a lot to say, but I do wanna, before we, we go, I do wanna say we will be sending out a follow-up survey to the RAC primary members and the alternates immediately after this meeting. Um, asking you more about equity outcomes. If there's more that you wish to say, this was a great discussion today. Thank you everyone for participating and giving us such, such thoughtful analysis. Um, but we definitely wanna hear from the alternates um, as part of this. So um, please uh, submit those to us and, um, and we will be folding those into the next packet. So we share those back out. We don't identify by name folks who filled out the surveys, but it helps to inform the work that we're doing in this, this continued conversation we'll be having. Thank you. And also quickly, Paige West, did you have another question or comment? Yeah, I couldn't find my, my raise hand uh, fast enough for uh, our last discussion. Uh, my, my question is uh, if there are other states that have embarked on this body of work already that uh, we might learn more about as part of this process and the amount of um, you know climate planning that we've been doing over the last 12 years or so it it, it, it seems to me like there's also local planning that's been happening uh, while we've been waiting for the state to kind of you know get get going a lot of local communities have been doing their own initiatives with climate planning and if we can learn about those um, as part of this process and then um, lastly, I neglected to also introduce Josh Skov, who is my alternate, and he is a board member of Lane Transit District, and I'll be leaning on him for some 
uh, more transit information as part of this process as well. Uh, Paige, it's great. Thanks. It's a great comment. I just want to follow up. I did neglected to uh, note that on page 21 of your packet, we did a pretty large survey um, of a lot of communities in Oregon this summer to help scope this work effort. And there's a hyperlink on the PDF that goes to the full survey that kind of drills down to, um, we asked very specific questions about what they're doing in equity and climate work um, right now. Um, so there's actually a lot of great information there. And in some of the interviews, what we heard was, of course, California is kind of known nationally um, for some of the climate work, but they're also doing some pretty innovative stuff in equity space too. So um, looking a little bit to some of the stuff they're doing down south. And then um, also the city of Seattle um, has a pretty um, innovative framework for equity um, screening that we might be looking at as well. Thank you. And Bill, did you have anything else on next steps before we go to our closing? Yeah, real quick, let me just talk about our next couple of meetings here. And uh, Cody is gonna be leading a lot of the, the work on these next couple of meetings, but um, I just wanted to go real quick so people knew what was coming up. Um, one of the things that we're gonna be doing uh, next meeting is reviewing what we talked about at this meeting and, and we're gonna be putting together a document which, which talks about a lot of the discussion we had at this round table, which were fabulous, um, really interesting, uh, lots of different uh, perspectives. I'm really glad we've, we've, we've put it together this way this time. Um, and uh, so we're gonna be going over that and, and reviewing that. Um, then we'll start getting into the, the meat of the work here with uh, some metropolitan scenario planning, um, some of the details of that and, and some of our uh, proposals, um, a little bit about regional planning. Um, these kind of work together and it's a little confusing sometimes to figure out what exactly is what, but um, you know, it, by the time we get there, we'll have something that it's clearer and makes sense uh, for folks, hopefully. Um, and of course, there'll be lots of time for uh, questions and, and discussion on these things. And then uh, in the new year, uh, we'll be starting with uh, our third meeting where we'll be uh, talking a little bit more about what we talked about in, in meeting two and reviewing those rules, those draft rules for the metropolitan areas, um, talking about performance measures, how we uh, our measure progress in those areas, um, what kind of, um, benchmarks and, and things we have to look at in, in, in terms of how that goes. And oh, I think that was it. Um, so I'll go, I'll go back here so you can see that. But um, yeah, yeah, that was real quick, just our next couple of meetings. And then uh, in your packet, of course, on page nine and 10, you can see uh, our proposed schedule over the next year or so. Um, and it's very, you know, brief little short things, but you know, each of those things will be a, a whole, a whole meeting. So Sylvia, back to you. Thanks, Bill. And yeah, I just want to echo um, Bill's appreciation for all the conversation today and the rich discussion, especially on e um, equitable outcomes. And I'll hand it over to Commissioner Lelak to close us out. Well, uh, thank you, Sylvia. That's exactly what I was going to say. And I was just so genuinely moved by so many of your comments. They um, they were so thoughtful and uh, I, it's so important to, to the success of both of our process now and as many of you talked about, the, the, the key is gonna be the implementation of this at the local level. And I, my hope, my genuine hope is that this process becomes a model for how our communities around the state then implement uh, the ultimate rules, uh, the ultimate rules that, that are, are adopted. And I'm inspired by your, your passion, your commitment, um, by your knowledge so much for, um, for, to, to share. And I learned so much from, from all of you today. So. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And I really look forward to our next discussion on uh, December 16th. Thank you. Thank you. All right. And thank you, everyone. Really appreciate your time and meeting adjourned.